Uh, I'm going to ask you about mm -hmm. Joe Barry, not about him, not okay. about you. Okay. We know you're the head coach. Okay. I want you to talk about his job and what he's done as defensive coordinator, not about you, about him. Tell yes. me why he's still in okay. this job. Well, it starts with me, and because uh, I sit in every game plan, I go through everything, it's what I want. And it goes from every assistant, top to bottom. I don't want to know about anybody else. I want to sure. ask you about him. You have the worst rated defense. Mm -hmm. Why is Joe Barry still employed as defensive coordinator? Why? Give me the reason why. Because I'm in every meeting. I lead it. I know. Ex I lead the meetings now. I know exactly what I want. On a light note, seriously, do you wish your daughter would have married a better defensive coordinator? Yeah. That was reporter Rob <laughs> Parker from the Detroit News. And guys, uh, first of all, your impressions of that. And, and did he go over the line with that last question you about know, asking if your daughter should have married a better you guy? You know, uh, Rob, you're an idiot. You okay, know, I, you're just a flat idiot. Why mm. you want to pursue a guy like uh, Rod uh, and, and pursue him on something after going 0-15? Uh, uh, you have, you know, disgraced your profession, my friend, and they ought to kick your butt out of that locker room. You are a total idiot. No, they should kick his butt out of the newspaper, period. It shouldn't be reporter. It should be ex-reporter. That's unnecessary. <laughs> They're 0-15. They lost. Ben's son-in-law had nothing to do Not with the record. All. He said, I'm in there. I control it. I run it. And obviously, it, it made no sense. He answered his question the first time. You know, they, they, he didn't need to get, keep badgering. And, and, and like you say, the guy's a jerk. I it mean, but, I, I, in every prof profession, you got people that are professionals, that are good, whatever. And then you got jerks like that that you have to deal with, unfortunately. You know, Rod Marin, it, it hasn't gone well in Detroit. That's obvious. And, and you can question whether he is, in fact, a legitimate head coach in the NFL. The record certainly indicates that that's not the case. I think he's a heck of a coach. I watch him down in Tampa Bay. Yeah. Heck of a coach. And someone's going to get a heck of a coach. But the last thing you could say, Rod Marinelli, through all of this, through good and bad, mm -hmm. has handled himself with class. I don't exactly. think that reporter can make that statement. Wow. Yeah, there's a difference between asking tough questions and getting personal, which it certainly yeah. turns it's like he's a headline hunter himself, right, Kurt? Yeah. I mean, that's just ridiculous. See? I'm Michael Kim with his first take update. Rob Parker admits that he and Lions head coach Rod Marinelli have a different relationship. Throughout this long, winless season, the former has questioned the latter about his defensive coordinator, Joe Barry, who happens to be Marinelli's son-in-law. Moments after the Lions lost to the Saints 42-7 to fall to 0-15 on the season, the reporter and the coach had this exchange. Rod, can you, can you fairly evaluate what is your son-in-law and his mm -hmm. family? Can you fairly evaluate, is there no way a circumstance you would fire him because he is your son-in-law? No. Does that have anything to do with it? No. But, but it doesn't make sense. I've worked with the same, problem. I've worked uh, with all these guys for years, and I know what they're about. I've worked with them in good times and bad times, and I know what we can produce, He's and we haven't done it. On a light note, seriously, do you wish your daughter would have married a better defensive coordinator? Yeah. Go ahead. Rob Parker of the Detroit News and, of course, contributor and a longtime friend of this show joins us now. And, Rob, with the Lions now at 0-15, many are out there wondering, why do you continue asking these questions, especially if you know nothing is going to change? Well, well, Michael, first let me say that I want to pu publicly apologize to Rod and his family if people really thought I was being mean-spirited and trying to... Uh, embarrassed his family in that way. It, th that that was not the intent. Uh, it was a it was a, uh, a chance at levity where uh, there was an intense exchange, and I was trying to lighten the mood later on in the press conference. So I want to just say that up front. Uh, but the bottom line is that the defense under Joe Barry was the worst last year in the NFL, and it is the worst this year. We just witnessed. Uh, in the game against the Saints, the worst defensive performance I've ever seen, where the Saints scored all seven of uh, six possessions that they had the ball and uh, made 11 straight third down conversions. And I was just trying to make the point about how bad of a job that the, the defensive coordinator had done. And I read your column today, Rob, and, and you make it seem like you and Rod Marinelli are on still pretty good terms. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I mean, to this point, Rod didn't get angry even after at what me you said yesterday. yesterday. Yes, I mean, after the, the press conference, I went up to the podium, and uh, Rod tapped me on my leg and said, see you tomorrow. And uh, I, I also talk about, he, he came up with a nickname for me uh, that he used around the other beat writers where he called me Gloomy Gus. 
And he told me about it, and I laughed about it, and I thought it was funny because of the type of questions that I'm always asking. And I never took it personally. I wasn't hurt or offended that he came up with a nickname behind my back. I took it as, as uh, you know, as something he was trying to be funny and cute. And I was trying to be funny, and a lot of people didn't think it was funny. All right. Rob Parker of the Detroit News and, of course, of ESPN First Take. Rob, thanks for joining us today. All right, guys. Appreciate it. All right. That does it for this First Take update. I'm Michael Kim. Now over to Jay. Oh, yeah, not so much. Third and goal from the two-yard line. McAllister, the running back, this crowd comes to life. McAllister puts his head down and scores. McAllister taking it in behind the blocking of Carl Nixon, Jonathan Goodwin. So the Saints on the scoreboard once more with 107 to play here in the opening quarter, a quarter that they have dominated. WWL letting you know the Lions are on their way to 0-15. They lose 42 to seven. They're never really in this one. They're the first team in NFL history to be 0-15 in one season. They're on their way to 0-16. The only game left for the poor Lions at Lambeau Field next week. They haven't won there since 1991. Lindsey Lohan was five years old the last time the Lions won at, at, at Lambeau, and, and that's the only thing standing between this franchise and, and, and just Infamy. I, infamy. Uh, oh, oh, and, oh, and 16. And, and uh, you know, I, I thought really this team three out of the last four weeks had, had been at least competing. You, you take away the Thanksgiving game and three of the last four weeks, they were either tied or leading in the fourth quarter. But I, I don't know, Eric, if, if you saw it like I did in terms of when it was 7-0, they scored a touch. They had a touchdown pass to Calvin Johnson that, that, that got called back on a penalty no, and it, it deflate. I mean, <laughs> like the last straw, I think, for this Lions football team, and they threw in the towel. Rod Marinelli, you feeling the pressure? The, the pressure stuff is, is it's not within me. You know, I'm, I'm excited to get this team ready to go again next week and go compete. I think they've been fighting. We didn't today. We didn't today, but they've been fighting, and then they've been practicing. But it didn't show today, and there's no excuses for it. I don't want to see the Lions go 0-16. This I, is a nice man. <laughs> These are the Honolulu the Blue Shirt Lions. This is Barry Sanders' franchise. Uh, they've lost 22 of 23 games. I mean, they're in a league of parity. How can you go 0-16? I think it's harder to go 0-16 than to go 16-0 and what the Patriots did last year. <laughs> It, well, it is. There, there's no question about that. But this team, they don't protect the quarterback well. They don't run the ball consistently. They don't stop the run. This team got zero sacks against the New Orleans Saints, despite the fact that Drew Brees threw it 40 times in this game. And you're looking at a franchise that has four interceptions this seat. Four. Four picks as a defense. When, when you have no chance to intercept the ball and you cannot pressure the other team's quarterback, you – you can't stop anybody. It's as simple as that. So how are we going to fix the Lions? Getting in a quarterback, bringing in Matthew Stafford out of Georgia or, or the Heisman uh, Trophy winner Sam Bradford is ooh. not going to be the answer. Well, well I, I think they're already off to, to a bad start right now, Eric. I mean, we can talk about the fact that they, they've gone and, and given taken the interim general manager title off Martin Mayhew without going through a process. Why not interview some general manager candidates that have personnel experience, that have drafted football players. Martin Mayhew is going to be there in two months, I, I promise you. There not a lot of people knocking on his door. He, yeah. He's a great player. He, he's a good guy. But why not go through the process? Why go out and, and, and take the interim tag off him before you've even finished your regular season? i got to think about trading that number one pick. Okay. But, 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 I, here's, what, here's what I want to do. But you can't here's what talk I do. Uh, in terms of the financial – the, f the money to come up into number one, to come up into that top three. Very if you, difficult if you to have do. some quarterbacks that are available based upon what Matt Ryan did for a franchise and based upon some teams like the Minnesota Vikings who need a quarterback, you have other franchises that are thirsting for a quarterback, I'd be thinking about that. The second thing I would do is I would be looking at, say, the Patriots and Scott Pioli, and I would say, hey, Too come? I, I understand, but I mean, <laughs> I, that, you're asking me how okay, I fix the line? I would, I would be looking very strongly at Matt Castle and bring him over as a free agent. So I would like to have Matt Castle trade the number one pick so I get some players on the defensive side and start accumulating second and third rounders. You've All done right. this for a long time. 
you know that second round picks are gold sure. because they're a lot cheaper, but you get almost the same production that you get traditionally oh. from some of the other guys in the first round. So second round picks are, are, are like diamonds in the NFL. So I would want second round picks for the overall pick. I would bring in a free agent quarterback like Matt Castle. I'd bring in a player personnel guy who knows what he's doing, and now maybe I got a little something. Uh, well, I'll give you the three prong. You, you, I'm going to give you the three prong. Uh, you Go got ahead. two. I'm going to go with Peoli as my general manager. Done. Josh McDaniels as my new head coach because he knows my system. Young guy. Fun. And Matt Castle, who I think as an unrestricted free agent fits this system. I like I, it. I'm a little scared about Matt Castle outside of that Patriots system, but I think that three prong right there, that gets us right on the right start. NFL primetime rolls on. You know what? It's the Saints and the Lions, and the Lions trying to avoid the first 0-15 start in NFL history. Uh, and things look good. Dan Orlovsky lobs one up to Calvin Johnson, 43 yards. Oh, it's just stealing it so easy. He gets a touchdown. It's Detroit. Nothing's easy. Uh, it's an illegal formation. Calvin Johnson says, oh, come on! It hurts my heart to watch. It, it does. Look, nobody wants to see them go 0-16. Oh. And then you have some secondary issues, and that's that's a bad thing against every Henderson, Drew Brees, and the Saints. That stealing. Yeah, that was. Uh, they would go up 28-7 at the half. Third quarter, uh, Lee Bodden loses Devery Henderson, and there's Devery Henderson, and eventually this play will take well, 60. That is just massive confusion. Well, you would say, if you were 0-14 going into this one, you'd be massively confused as well, okay? Well, Later in the drive. You get it going. Well, you'd think. It's yeah, never well, happened it's before. <laughs> Drew Brees to Marcus Colson reaches in for the touchdown. It's now 35-7. to Yeah, you go. Uh, now third and eight. Brees looking for Colson again. There's 30 yards. A little easy pitch and catch. Uh, by the way, we'll just sum up this. Breeze, 30 of 40, 351 yards, two touchdowns, uh, including another one to Colston here. He only needs 402 yards, Breeze does, to uh, become the uh, single greatest passing season of all time. The Saints beat them 42 to 7. They're 0 and 15, and they're already expunging the Lions from their own oh, field. God. It's it's bad. It's bad. Those of you who thought the Lions would dig deep and rally to a victory this week, uh, 42-7. Rod Marinelli saying the team was out coached on offense and defense and special teams. That just about covers it. The NFL now with its first 0-15 team ever. Is this really going to happen, Woody? I want to apologize to the people of Detroit. I said last week I thought that they deserved one victory. They didn't need to go. 0-16 this year, they're having tough times enough in the automobile industry. Everybody in Detroit wrote me and said they prefer 0-16. Okay. okay, I'm on their side. Inside information. Got we are not scaremongering. This is really happening, Tony. Detroit is going to go 0-16, and I think you're better off. If you're going to be bad, don't be 1-15 and, and just be bad. Do something in legendary fashion. Then you can come back from that, and that's a better story. Okay, <laughs> that's one idea. Ryan? 31 and 96 since Mr. Millen showed up. They will be 31 and 97. They will lose 23 out of 24. They will have done this on complete merit. I stand in awe of their astonishing across the board ineptitude. Ladande. You know how a group of lions is called a pride? Well, we're going to have to change that because these lions have no pride. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone out and lost to a deflated New Orleans team that had lost Reggie Bush and lost any hope of making the playoffs. I thought they could have done it, maybe get one victory. No, it's not happening. 0 and 16. But it's not hopeless for these lions. Well, it is hopeless this year. But it does. Last in this segment and in the standings are the pathetic Detroit Lions. They're now 0 and 15 after getting spanked by the Saints. Their last chance to win a game comes next week in Green Bay, where they haven't won since 1991. Yeah. Still, owner William Ford must like something he sees. He announced yesterday he's keeping the team's top management, though he was mum on coach Rod Marinelli. Tone, how sad is this? Well, it's sad that they're going to go 0-16, and they're going to go 0-16 because they're not they're a dome team. They're not going out in Green Bay and winning that game. No, they probably aren't. But I, and, and I understand there's outrage in Detroit that he's keeping a management team, but he's not necessarily keeping the coaches. He's not keeping a head coach necessarily. He's not keeping the players. I would prefer they swept the whole thing out, but I don't know that people who just got on the job like I mean, six weeks on. ago have yeah. to go. I mean, keeping a COO, the money guy, and keeping Martin Mayhew, a smart guy that I know from his time in Washington who's been interim, you have to sweep the interim people out. The coach has got to go. Well, he's he was go. mum yesterday. He's going to go fine. But you know, Tone, I was stunned yesterday. 
I was really shocked that the Lions just took it in the chops like this from an okay New Orleans team. They just rolled over yesterday. New Orleans is pretty good indoors, and that's why they were able and to do that. And their offense is good. They're pretty good indoors. Yeah. The amazing thing is that Joey Harrington, who's a reserve quarterback now for the Saints, is quoted as saying, I didn't realize my time there was the heyday of the franchise. <laughs> because now they ought to rehire Matt Millen. I, I, it, it is, it, it's... It's very, very sad. It it's is. awful. It's, it's sad to go 0-16. And you know, it's a tough time to be bad in Detroit with all the problems going on. There. Maybe they can get a bailout. Woo. Let's take a break. Um, the Lions trying to avoid the most unappealing way to make history mm. in the NFL by becoming the first team ever to go 0-16 in a 16-game regular season, taking the bagel. 0 oh, and 16. <laughs> Can they save their season? How do you do it? Marcellus, how does this downtrodden team find a way to get a win? Well, I don't think they can win. I mean, I just think this season has been lost. And I've been on the 0 and 10 team in high school, and I went to Columbia. And we know <laughs> of the woes of that program. But at the same time, you know, when you're 0 and 15, you know, you just don't want to go out, you know, to the mall. No excuses. You order all the Chinese food in. You order Pizza Hut in. You just don't want to be seen. And I think right now, this team has to look forward to the offseason. I mean, they could build around Calvin Johnson at the receiver position, Kevin Smith at the running back position. But other than that, um, it's not really a lot of talent that stands out for this team. No. I mean, and there's really no way to salvage the situation. I mean, one in 15 doesn't mean that it was a success. And it, and it, it does really, if you were 0 and 15 yeah, going it, into it the really last really one. Does. They asked the Miami Dolphins. There's really no consolation in that. And, and, and look, I don't even think it's going to happen. And it should tell you something. When you sign a quarterback that's retired and you sign him off the street and he starts for you that week, that's a <laughs> that problem <laughs> with your organization, how you've drafted quarterbacks and how you've managed your roster. Yeah, and, it's, and at this point, Whatever happens in the offseason, it's not just about changing a coach or a coach. They should be in a biohazard team. Mm -hmm. and wipe everything down. Change the carpet. Change the paint. <laughs> they, I mean, really, they, they need a cleansing, don't they? They're yeah. forever identified with yeah. it. And that's a problem because it's going to follow you wherever you go at this point. Yeah, it affects the culture and that affects the mindset of the players. So you do have to go with a clean sweep. Roy Williams, who's now with the Cowboys, says he still gets grief because he was in Detroit when they took the team picture. And Cowboys, or the Cowboy <laughs> players are still giving him grief because he's sort of attached to that as well. Mm -hmm. And here's what makes it even worse for the Lions, if that's possible. They haven't won in Green Bay since 1991, and Detroit hasn't won a divisional road game in December or January since 1997. Their last regular season divisional road win late in the season came at Minnesota by a point. 14-13, mm. December 14th, 1997. Mm. Come on, Lions! <laughs> when we continue... <laughs> On the verge of NFL infamy, the Lions couldn't have picked a worse spot to need to win to prevent the first winless 16-game season in NFL history. Lambeau Field, where Detroit hasn't won since 1991, when Eric Kramer was the quarterback, Wayne Fonts was the coach, and the Lions rode Barry Sanders all the way to the NFC Championship. And even that victory in Green Bay was decided by inches. As Rachel Nichols reports, the Lions are just as close now to joining a club nobody wanted to form in the first place. Simply put, this was not winning football. I failed. They need to just play better football. They are winless. They're being soundly beat on both sides of the football. A couple weeks ago, Coach put just a team photo up. Coach Manelli put us up on the screen. So this is the team that will end up going in Canton if you guys end up going on 16. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is full of grainy film, old uniforms, bronze busts. And if the Lions don't beat Green Bay on Sunday, they too could wind up in Canton for their ineptitude. It was stark realism of, wake up, you guys are men, you're professionals, and this is your product, this is our product, and we better do something about it. Obviously, I mean, everybody plays this game to try to end up in Canton someday as an individual because you want to be a Hall of Famer. You never want to end up there uh, for a negative reason. For me, personally, it just left a bad taste in my mouth. For many, the entire Lions season has been a bad taste. Fifteen players, nearly one-third the roster, have been put on injured reserve. Five of the last six home games have been local TV blackouts, and a city already reeling from the failing auto industry has seen its team turned into a national punchline. The Arena Football League announced they are canceling the entire 2009 season. Whoa. Canceling the whole season, yeah. So which the Detroit Lions said, you can do that. <laughs> We're professionals, we're competitive, uh, we love this game, and we play this game to win. And uh, when you're not doing that, and uh, when you're getting criticized, and you're getting critiqued for every little thing, um, it's tough on you as, a, as an individual, and it's tough on us as, as a team. Difficult, frustrating, um, there's been a lot of embarrassing moments. Roy Wright ran out of bounds, he ran out of the end zone at the safety. James got to know that. 
No one knows what the Lions are going through better than the 76 Bucks, whose 0-14 record currently makes them the only team in the modern era without a win or tie. It was so horrendous and just so mentally and physically draining that you're, you're, you're not too sure about yourself as a uh, professional athlete. Then my daughter Lisa at that time was about uh, eight or nine years old, so she was in the crowd booing, and somebody told, told her she's booing our dad. She, she said, oh, everybody's booing, I thought that's what you're supposed to do. If you go out to dinner, you can tell there's a few whispers and fingers being pointed that that's one of those Buccaneers that hadn't won a game yet. Can't stop a pass or a run. The wise are in great shape. There are a hell of a lot of careers going in Monday. We're not proving one thing here. We, we prove we can't play. And these bucks know that feeling of futility doesn't end when the season does. You kind of hear about it for the rest of your life um, because you're, you make that mark in history. I wouldn't wish this record on anybody else. And uh, I don't know how the other guys on the Buccaneers feel, but I, I just didn't keep it. I don't wish that on anybody. I know especially what those coaches are feeling and what those players are feeling. That is not a great feeling, and it's not anything for me to celebrate. It's certainly not an image the Lions want, but their chances of ending up in Canton will be on their minds with every tick of the clock in Green Bay. Your mind changes when you get into the fourth quarter on Sunday because you know you have a little sense of urgency. So if 0-16 if and embarrassment isn't enough motivation, then you should have it for being a professional football player. The Lions looking for a miracle in this tackle. Bad decision. You can't do that in this league and survive. Survive, 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 survive. Rachel Nichols reporting. It's a 500-mile, eight-hour drive around the southern shore of Lake Michigan to get from Detroit to Green Bay. And that's in good weather, which it won't be this weekend. The forecast at kickoff Sunday at Lambeau Field, snow showers and 7 degrees with the wind chill. We welcome back Drew Sharp, longtime columnist for the Detroit Free Press, who saw the team go 4-0 in the preseason. But take us back even further. You were there in 1991, as we mentioned, the yeah. last time the Lions won at Green Bay. What's been the team's biggest blunder since? The biggest blunder since 1991? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the, it's the same mistake, and it starts with ownership. William Clay Ford Sr. That's been, the, that's, that's been the one constant with this, Steve, in that you know, people now are actually taking a serious look nationally at what is systemically wrong with this organization. And you, it all starts with ownership. He's been the sole owner for 44 years. Uh, during that time, this team has only won one playoff game, one playoff victory since, their, uh, since 1957. So what is it that he has done or has not done? Well, again, it, it, his biggest problem is that it, 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 it starts with a lot of the guys he's hired. He does not fire them quick enough. This is a man who, who, who treats his employees as though they were his family. And that's good if, you want, if you're looking for a guy who's a good friend. But if you're running a business, you have to look at it with a more cold-blooded attitude. When he hired Midland in, in 1999, myself, I was one of those people who, one of the writers who thought it was a good idea because at least they were thinking outside the box. No one figured that he would stay on that job for seven games and three games into his eighth season with a, with a 25, uh, with a 250 winning percentage. This is why this team deserves to go 0-16 and, and why the one guy who's going to wear that stigma for the rest of his life is William Clay Ford Sr. What do you think they ought to do with the inevitable number one draft pick? Well, again, you know, it's going to be impossible to trade that pick now because you tie in so much uh, guaranteed money. Jake Long last year was the number one pick with, with, with the Miami Dolphins, a left tackle, got $30 million. So if you're going to have the number one pick, you have to get the most value. And, and that limits it to a quarterback or a home run hitting running back or a big play d defensive end. Chances are, and people don't want to hear this in Detroit, it's probably going to be a quarterback. Either Stafford, the young man from Georgia, or Sam Bradford, the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback from Oklahoma. What's your holiday wish for the Detroit Lions that you've covered year after year after year? Uh, my, ho my holiday wish is going to come true. The season ends Sunday, regardless of what happens. We don't have to watch any more of this garbage. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think will happen on Sunday? Steve, I've been maintaining that this team was going to win a game because it is impossible, the way the NFL legislates parity, it's impossible for a team to go 0-16. In, go in well, they convinced me. They beat me down enough that, you know, Green Bay is going to win this game. I think the Lions will play them tough because they play tougher on the road than they have at home this season. But this is just a bad, bad team. The worst team, non-expansion team ever assembled in the NFL 
They're going to lose Sunday. It's going to be 0-16. Drew Sharp, we empathize. It's not easy feeling sorry for a sports journalist, but in this case, you've, you've got it about as rough as it could be. Drew Sharp on Outside the Lines. Take care, Steve. Finally, as Terry said last week, congratulations to the Lions. They could make history today and go 0-16. The only other team in the modern era to lose every game in a season was the expansion Bucks from 1976. They couldn't even hide because their uniforms glowed in the dark. Here's head coach John McKay on the Bucks, and it sounds like the Lions. You can't stop a pass or a run. Otherwise, we're in great shape. Well, we didn't block them, no. but we made up for it by not tackling. Yes, that definitely sounds a lot like the Lions. And, you know, today they wrap up the season in Great Green Bay, where they have not won since 1991. That was back when the first George Bush was president. Falcons quarterback Matt Ryan was only six years old. Nirvana releases Smells Like Teen Spirit and the big news, of course, in 1991. Raids Against the Machine meant TV was mad at his VCR. All right, Terry. <laughs> now, last week, you said you actually wanted to see the Lions go 0-16. You still well, feel that way? Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, why, why? not? Why? Why? It's, it's epic. I know I'm a scumbag. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't pull for people to lose, but you I wanted Michael. I, that's okay. I wanted Michael Strahan's Giants to lose to New England. You all knew that because I wanted to see history. I wanted to be a part of history. Today would be epic. 0 and 16. That is just to me. That's cool. 1 and 15. Big deal. You were 1 and 15. I find nothing wrong with it. They're going to get the best player in college that comes out. I think it's a good Going deal. undefeated and winning a Super Bowl is famous. No, but it's history. Losing historical. every game is infamous. It's you historical. talked about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the last team to go 0-14 during the regular season. That was an expansion football team, and unlike the Carolina Panthers or the Jacksonville Jaguars, which had two picks per round, that was truly an expansion team. It, it's mind-boggling in the setup in the NFL today that they could go 0-16. You did see history, by the way. You saw the team lose the only game at the last exactly. game. And that's why I love you guys, man, because you were so wrong <laughs> picking that game. Well, I loved it. But also, I guess I look at it kind of like Terry does. You can either be another 1-15 team or you can be an 0-16 team. What's the difference? You might as well have your face well, on the Well, if you're a player on that no. team, you want to win one, don't you? I mean, Jimmy, oh, you're no. the only guy up here who's actually been through something like this. Your first year in Dallas, you were 1-15. Uh, you guys might make light of it, but let me tell you what. I'm not. You, you, I can't describe how miserable you feel being part of that. I mean, I mean... You know, hey, at Miami, we, we lost two regular season games in four years, so I thought we were going to win. Even though we took over the worst team in the league, I mean, I can't tell you how I was devastated I was when we didn't win. You know, I was so mentally and physically drained. I couldn't wait for that season but to be over. Game, Don, would recovered? one game <laughs> have no, made hey, any when, difference? When you're that low, you can't get What's any lower. That's <laughs> Dominic, <laughs> Ri Dominic Rioli wants to invite both of you by his house. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? And he'll give you the address. We'll Sam that. Bradford, pack your bags. <laughs> quarterback out of OU. I'm sure he's get headed to Detroit. Heisman Troy. Trophy winner from, hey, uh, hey, from you, know, you know, by the way, my favorite sign about the Lions that I've seen, higher. Millet. Fans had that last week. You it's know what I'm saying? That's, I'm that's telling great. you. Back at Lambeau Field, Packers lead the Lions 14 to 7. Now, obviously, the winless Lions are not the best story in the NFL, but they do provide the best material. Ask Fox's Frank Caliendo. Hey, it's Frank Caliendo. Now, the Lions may not have made it easy to be a fan this year, but they sure did make it easy to be a pregame comedian. Yeah, the Lions have the same record as Terry Bradshaw trying to date supermodels. Zero for 14. <laughs> hey, what are the Detroit Lions and me have in common? We're both 0 for 8. <laughs> no one wants a tie, except maybe the Lions. Hmm? At this point, they'd be thrilled with the tie. Have you ever noticed you always feel sick and bloated a couple days after Thanksgiving? Not because of all the food but from watching the Lions play. Detroit Lions center Dominic Raiola flipped off Lions fans at a home game. What were you thinking? No, not Dominic, but what were those guys thinking being Lions fans? Hey, honey, what's the difference between Oliver Stone and the Lions? At least Oliver Stone got a W this season. <laughs> All right, so what's happened since the Lions last win against Kansas City? Now it's been 371 days and counting all the way till next September. We've elected a new president in this country. Michael Phelps has been kicking a little tail. And, well, Brett Favre retired, then unretired, <laughs> then started playing again. Who knows what he's going to do next? <laughs> so here we go. No ties for the 76 Buccaneers nor the 08 
Detroit Lions. Grant is going to run it again for a few more yards. Both he and Grant over 100 yards this afternoon. Well, now it's all about what do the Lions do with those draft picks. Big questions. They have two first-rounders. Of course, the first one overall. They'll also have the Dallas Cowboys selection in the 09 draft. And speaking of the Cowboys, because of what happened earlier today with Tampa losing at home against Oakland and with Chicago losing at Houston, that Dallas-Philly game that's coming up next is essentially a playoff game. The winner advances. The loser goes home as you get a look at some of the other scores like Atlanta winning against the Rams and Carolina clinching the two seed with a last second win in New Orleans. So we have our first 0 and 16 team John Lynch. You ever think you would see it? I never thought I would. I, you know games are hard to win in this in, in this uh, league but it's a league set up for parity. The Lions, how they got themselves into this mess, they had the number one, you know, top ten picks over and over and over. They missed completely. Not only they miss, I mean, you got guys like Ernie Sims. People may not be happy with how far he's come, but he's still playing at a high level. You can't have guys like Mike Williams, Charles Rogers that are no longer in the league. You can't have Joey Harrington as the number three quarterback down in New Orleans. You can't miss that bad. That is the final snap of the season. Here at Lambeau Field. And the O in Motown officially stands for O in 16, the first of its kind in NFL history. For John Lynch, I'm Chris Rose. Packers a winner, Philly and Dallas next. Hey, look, kids, the bus hey. is back in the studio. We'll hear from him in just a bit, but let's get the highlights rolling with the Lions and the Packers. Dan's got it. Could the Lions win one, Dan? Um, do you want me to have drama here and tell you? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to ruin it for you. Like I wasn't paying attention earlier. Yeah. Just go ahead. Guess who was undefeated during the preseason? The Detroit Lions. Uh, that is a flotation device as well for Coach Marinelli. <laughs> and you'll need it. And all the losses figures they'd be done in by a guy named Wynn. Deshaun Wynn, 73-yard touchdown run, 7 nothing Packers. He had 7 carries, 106 yards. Aaron Rodgers to Jermichael Finley of the Spurs. He had uh, 2 <laughs> catches on the day, 14 nothing Packers. Dan Orlovsky to Calvin Johnson. The big mismatch had nine catches, 102 yards. The Lions defense had only four interceptions during the year. They did force the fumble here on Ryan Grant. Ouch. That led to a uh, Detroit touchdown. First play after that touchdown, it's Rodgers to Donald Driver. 21 of 31, 308 yards, three touchdowns, 31-21 Packers. Driver over 1,000 yards receiving. Fifth straight year for him to do so and 0-16, they earned it, 31-21 the final. In his two games against Detroit this season, Rodgers threw for over 600 yards, six touchdowns. Lions allowed just over 32 points per game, worse than the NFL. Some of the other disturbing numbers there. That's how you go 0-16. They were uh, last in all of those categories, or first if you want to look at the other way around. Uh, after the game, Coach Marinelli faced the firing squad. The record speaks for itself. We know what that is, and uh, my feelings about it are be kept to myself. But uh, the record speaks for itself. No compare. All right, the Lions evidently unable to simulate game conditions at any time. <laughs> oh, and 16. Your take. <laughs> you know, Rod Marinelli, I think, said it right. He said, we own the record, we deserve it, man up. And that's the way he's been throughout. And the discussion is going to be, is this the worst team in history? No, I watched the 76 Bucks. That was the worst team in history. So, But they only had 14 games. Therefore, uh, they were only 0-14. <laughs> Although they took it to 0-26 so the next year. The Lions were just a little better. They continued their hey, streak. Uh, on, a, on a bright note, the Lions did say they weren't raising ticket prices next year, Bob. That's big of them. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> the Rams were at Atlanta, and that meant something. Conventional wisdom had it that for the Lions to avoid going 0-16 and winning in Green Bay, that something other than Lambeau Field would have to freeze over. The Packers came out and put it to the Lions. 
Deshaun win untouched 73 yards. Not the way they really wanted to start. But no, they've been. Keep fighting, guys. Keep fighting. Now, later in the first quarter, Charles Woodson bags Dan Olasky. Pro bowler, all pro, who vibed his entire career going to Green Bay playing on the other side of Al Harris. Packers would get a touchdown of that. Pick 14 0. That's a nice jacket. But they do have a nice jacket. A little Gore-Tex. With a man. Right, man. But here's Dan Orlovsky. Calvin Johnson's making plays. He doesn't. He's no quit. He's no quitter. No, he's a bright spot this year. 14-7 in the third quarter. Dan Orlovsky to Calvin Johnson rolling in the end zone. It's a tie game. In a tie ball game in the third quarter. Could the Lions do it? He's That's wearing Gore-Tex. Nice jacket. You like the jacket? That's a nice jacket. But the Packers are uh, up 10 when Kevin Smith is running it in and making a three-point game again. Yeah, they believe. They believe 1 in 15 Lions. However, Aaron Rodgers to Donald Driver. And all the Lions were left with for 16 losses. And some uh, quality Gore-Tex jackets. Mm. A rough one. That's Owen three 16. nice jackets. A very prideful man. No competitor wants to go through something like this. It's not fun to go through, and obviously, but there's people going through a lot worse than this. And so I just think it's how you conduct yourself. The biggest thing in this is how you conduct yourself afterwards. You accept, I, I, we accept responsibility for everything went down. We have nobody to point a finger at other than ourselves. We just have to. We didn't do do our job correctly, and so there's a a lot to learn from that. And uh, when you're in adversity, you accept, it, uh, accept the adversity, try to fight through it, and try to get better. And I think these men did. We, now, our record doesn't show that, not, not at all. But uh, they fought. I like him. Detroit Free like Press him. summed it up. Woe Town. Colorado's right. They fought. They played hard in every game. They weren't good enough, but they played hard in every game. So, I like him. Needless to say, the lines were on the clock. They yeah. are the uh, is your draft order. Mm. Lions first, Rams second consecutive year. They'll pick two. Got the Chiefs, Seahawks, Browns, Bengals, Raiders, Jaguars, Packers, Niners. If any of these teams need a little bit of inspiration, three of the teams playing on Wild Card Weekend, three of them were in the first eight of the draft order last year. Oh. Miami, Atlanta, and the Raiders. Think oh. about that. Chew I on can that. see the Jaguars and the Packers. To ESPN First Take, I'm Michael Kim. Well, what would you do if your team went winless through an entire season? Give up on them, find another team, or stick it out no matter how painful that may be? These are all legitimate questions facing Detroit Lions fans today. Now, a couple of fans found a creative way to help answer these questions. They created Lions Rebuilding Since 1957.com, and now these t shirts, 2008 preseason champions are also available and so it goes in Detroit where the Lions go down in the record books as the only team to go 0 and 16 and we welcome in longtime Lions fans and the creators of since 1957.com Doug and Ed Zuba gentlemen thanks so much for joining us on on this tough day uh, let me first of all get your reaction to the firing of Rod Marinelli uh, you want to take this no you go ahead I, uh, <clears throat> well uh, it's necessary uh, I expected this to happen pretty much when they went 0-13, 0-14, 0-15, and obviously 0-16, you can't keep a guy like that. Uh, so it was very expected. I would say the more surprising thing was the uh, uh, keeping the GM and not looking for other candidates possibly. Uh, that, I think, is a mistake. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. Bill Parcells yeah. uh, could right. be could be available to the Lions if they so desire, but uh, we'll see about that. Meanwhile, what kind of response are you guys getting, and, and what are your own emotions like since yesterday's loss, the 16th out of 16 tries this season? Well, it, it was expected, and we prepared ourselves for it. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't blindside you. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's Actually, good. That's like, good. Always be prepared. Yeah, well, knowing the Lions, they probably would have won yesterday just to kind of put a, put a uh, you know, mix it up a little bit. Now, how They're good bad. how good has this been for business, or how bad has this been for business? Outstanding. It, it's been good. We, uh, I mean, it's, it's under weird circumstances. You know, it's not like you really set this up to really. Obviously, now at this point, it's it's good that we're doing this for us, but it's kind of under circumstances I really aren't, I'm not too happy about. I'd like to see a better team than to make money selling shirts about our terrible team. You know, yeah. it's it's kind of a catch-22 a little bit. We we don't want to send the wrong impression. Yeah, we do want the Lions to win the Super Bowl. We're we're fans of that. Okay, but we're so far away. 
I mean, we are so far from that uh, that, uh, hey, we thought, well, let's take this opportunity and uh, make some light of it. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of people that have enjoyed the shirt and, and what we're all about. And, you know, really quick, I just want to mention, though, our website is since57.com. Right. Since the website you've mentioned before is a different site yeah. that okay. has nothing to do with us. Yeah. I apologize uh, for that. Oh, since no, that's fine. 57 we're just that. Okay, and, yeah, and you're actually, 57. Ed, you're actually wearing one of the T-shirts there, right? Uh, the 2008 right. preseason champion T-shirt. Yeah, this is the first one that we did uh, back in September, and as of yesterday, we have a new one out, which is on our website as well. And okay, that tell us about that one. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Basically, the shirt concept is extremely simple. It says 0 and 16, <laughs> but it's in Roman numerals. Uh, uh, I like that, I, I like could, that. You, well, I don't know if you know this or not, but obviously Super Bowl 16 was in Detroit. Well, it was in Pontiac, okay. right. and so it's a little play off of Super Bowl 16. If you kind of look at the logo, you'll you'll see a resemblance, and then we just kind of play off of the, the terribleness that is our Lions, and then on the back is the schedule of the 2008 season, and uh, it's available on our website. So basically, you can kind of get both, and then on top of that, we also have a poster available yes. that will be available later this week. We're just dealing with some logistics on that, but it's it's kind of a you know, it's a it's very similar to the shirt, but it's it's kind of something you can hang on your wall and keep forever. It'll it'll hopefully it'll turn into an heirloom. You know, it's when they win the Super Bowl <laughs> 30 years from now, you, right. you can posters. you can put them next you know close uh, next to each other and uh, you know it'll be uh, kind of ironic. Well, well, Ed, you said that you guys are longtime fans and you want your team to win, but yes. what's been the response to these shirts? And and what do you say to any fans who think you are maybe betraying or mocking the Lions? Uh, I don't think we are, and uh, uh, we really try to ignore any comments that we are betraying the Lions. I mean, let's face it, uh, the people that uh, do kind of get angry with us are the people that are wearing, you know, the $100 jerseys and uh, the hats, and they're all decked out, and I look at them and say, well, don't spend that money with them. Spend it with us, mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll give you a shirt, and it's cheap. Well, how and, much and is it? And there's a little humor involved. How much involved. is it? $15. Okay. Well, you Much know, better the, the deal, big, especially in the these times, size, right? Yeah, the bigger sizes are a little more. You know, but and, and just to piggyback off that a little bit, I mean, you, this team has been bad for a long time. Right. It's not like this is the first year it's happened. I mean, we started this four years ago right. with a, a, a simple T-shirt idea of rebuilding since '57, and it's four years later, and we're not talking to you right now. It, this isn't something that's getting better. I feel like this is pos a possible step of them doing something to get better. You know, and we're in essence, I guess, yeah, we are capitalizing on it. But then again, we're also not buying tickets and we're not season ticket holders. You know, I'd much rather go support the Red Wings, you know, a team that I actually find is, is, is a good representation of our city and, and of the and good the sports Tigers. town we live in. And so, and the Pistons. It, well, of course, of yeah. course. Um, so. but, but, you know, it, it, this all hurts. This is hurtful to everybody, especially this time of the year. But this is a little humor, so it makes it a little lighter. I all right, so besides the humor and besides obviously the business that you guys are generating with these shirts, what else can you take away from an 0 and 16 season? What other what other positives can you take away? Wow, positives. Oh, well, well you know, <laughs> I would have said I would have said the fact that they can blow it up and then you know start anew, but then they go and hire Mayhew, which is part of the organization for the past. Yeah, but is he to blame? Years. I mean, he's taking over middle of the season. I you mean, know, uh, he, he wasn't going to be able to stop the losing trend just no. coming in. A good at, uh, a good point I heard season. on the radio today was that if a guy is underneath, like for example, he was under Millen for this time. If, if he was so opposed to the Millen's doings, do you think he'd still have a job eight years later if he continually argued with the boss? I, I feel like he's probably has a very similar mindset, and you're not, we went 0-16. That's the worst you can possibly be, and so you're gonna, you're gonna keep a guy that was part of that system opposed to bringing in something completely different. You can't do any worse than that. So I guess that's my take on it. I'm not saying he's a bad guy, he does a bad job. It's just, you, just can't, you just can't keep a guy like that. We, we really don't blame the players or the coaches uh, and some of management, you know, but it, it boils down to the owner. Yeah. It yeah. really does. And that's been our kind of our mantra all through these four years is the owner. It's yeah. We weren't on the fire mill and bandwagon. We yeah. were really on the Ford is the issue. And, of course, Ford. now he is. Everyone sees that now. Yeah. Um, so. Well, a uh, change has been made as far as the head coach is concerned. Yeah. I don't think yeah. we're going to see a change in ownership anytime soon, but no, Rod right. Marinelli is out as the head coach, and so yet another rebuilding, reconstruction of this franchise yes. will begin. So, Doug yes. and Ed Zuba, thanks so much for joining us here on ESPN First Take, anytime. and good luck anytime. with the sales of your shirt on 50, since57.com, correct? correct? Correct. Thank you very much. I appreciate since it. Since57.com. All right, guys, yes. thanks Thank so much, you. and good luck next year. There's always next they, year. Oh, yeah, we'll thanks. be there. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Awful, embarrassing, we stunk, any bad adjective you can use.
it was tough on us as, as a team. Why do you think Calvin didn't make the Pro Bowl? From the rookies, you know, you don't know what it's feel like to um, win an NFL game. If 0-16 an embarrassment isn't enough motivation, then you should have it for being a professional football player. The Detroit Lions just completed the worst eight-year stretch of professional football since World War II. Rod Marinelli lost 23 of his last 24 games and yesterday completed the one and only winless season in ever since the schedule went to 16 games. The only injury today is me. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I know I had a few jokes, but no, uh, if you just uh, bear with me for one second and then I'll just open up to some questions. Um, just like to take a moment, thank Mr. Ford. That's important, and he, to give me this opportunity I had here, at, uh, Coach Alliance. Um, I like to thank our staff, and uh, all, all the staff, and trainers, and equipment men, all the way down. And uh, our staff, they did a great job all year. Hung in there, and uh, the fans of the community, and the community itself, is very special to me. Great place to live, and uh, above all, the team and the quality of men we had here this year. And I, I think they've left a foundation to build on. I know that. Um, Nick, you asked me a question last night. Um, is this the worst team of all time? And uh, I said the record will speak for itself. But also, I should have added also, um, when you, you say worst, I always look at quitters. That's what worst is to me. Um, Non-caring, people who give up, um, pout, cry, point fingers. That's worst. That our record speaks for itself. But when I look at worst, that is worst. And uh, this group of men, we didn't succeed on the field in terms of our record, but they succeeded in everything I wanted them to do in terms of we, we came a long ways in terms of how to be a football team. And uh, the record doesn't show it, but it's a, it's a start and it's a foundation. Um, we've conducted ourselves, I think, very well. And uh, we've been complimented on how we've conducted ourselves, like an A. And I don't see it that way. I see what we've done is supposed to be just bare minimum. It's a standard. It's a C. 20 years ago, this was a C. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to act. This is supposed to how you conduct yourself in adversity or whatever. You're supposed to. That's, that was supposed to be the norm. Now, it looks like it's something special. And that's wrong. It's not anything special. You get paid to do a job. You're paid to conduct yourself a certain way, and that's how you're supposed to do it. So we, we didn't do anything above and beyond other than what we're supposed to do. And uh, with that, uh, I'll open up to questions. Rob, yeah. looking back, this team at one point was 6-2, and, and then things did not really yeah. the rest of the way. What happened? Yeah. You know, I, well, I've wrestled with that one a lot, Tom, and I, uh, um, I, I go back to that, that following week and and, and you hope it's not I, I created higher standards at that point you know I, we talked about the playoffs we talked about having a chance to get a seat you know let's play for a home field advantage and I, I don't want to believe that was it but boy once I started down that road and I have not done that before I, it was all one snap at a time one day at a time and somehow I lost something and we lost something at the Arizona game and then uh, we came back with the Giants the next week and we lost a real tough close game there, and then it, uh, we never were able to capture it. But it seemed even you know, the Dallas game was yeah. very competitive, but then it seemed like when things ended yesterday, yeah. you, this team wasn't even competitive. No, I agree. Defensively. And I agree with you 100%. And it's just, uh, it's, it's hard to, it, it's been very hard to put a finger on it for me. As much as you run yourself, mm -hmm. Oh, I believe so. You know, I think when you're a head coach, you come in, and, and the one thing you've got to do is coach. And you've got to get these guys to play to a high standard. And I know I worked very hard at that. But um, bottom line is when you put it on the field and the lack of execution, that, that goes back on us. They don't fire players. They, they fire coaches. So you, you put your faith in people. Oh, yeah. Turnkey, you know, I think, yeah, um, I think I, I'm just the type when I get the right people, I put it all in. And I don't worry if it comes back or not. I don't care. Once I go that way with it, and I believe in a guy, it's full speed. And I, I just, uh, that's why I'm built. And I give you everything I got. And uh, if you fool me, good for you. 
So at 0-16, the Lions have the most losses by a winless team in league history. They join the list of woeful teams in the history of the four major professional sports. The 74-75 Washington Capitals went 8-67-5. That was an expansion year, though. The 72-73 Sixers won nine of their 82 games. And the 1916 Philadelphia Athletics finished with a record of 36 and 117. And there's a couple NBA teams, namely the Oklahoma City Thunder, that will be on the watch this year. They only have a few wins through this point of the season. Back here on the hot list, Brad Weinstein, Eric Allen, Kadri Ismail doing some overtime, and we appreciate that today. I want you guys to look at this from a player perspective for a moment with the Lions. You head into an offseason. If you were in that locker room, you just played on the worst team in the history of the NFL. How do you live with that through this offseason? Why do you have to say the worst team? <laughs> <laughs> they are. But that's I what mean, no, they men, are. No, mentally, that's what you're thinking. Like, we are the worst team. Team, all that work I did in the offseason for nothing. I mean, if you're Calvin Johnson, you got over a thousand yards receiving, what, multiple touchdowns, you know, you just felt like, you know what, I, I, I should have, what else could I have done to help this team? And I mean, that's what every guy really should be asking themselves. What is it? What did I do to contribute or not contribute to uh, just a, a, a weak and poor effort? I mean, usually in the NFL, you're, you're all about winning and Sometimes you luck out into wins, but to go over it just it, it, it boggles the mind. Yeah, it does. And the same way on the other side of the ball, a guy like Ernie Sims, you think uh, you, you want to point out those things. You're talking about positives because there's always some positive you can get out of this. With you know, 0 and 16, but I think Calvin Johnson's a positive on offense. Ernie Sims is a positive on defense. You got to keep focus on those guys and find some guys to kind of complement uh, those those teammates. But as a as a teammate and as a player on a team, all the all the shirts and hats, you're not wearing any of that stuff outside. You know what I'm saying? You, you're getting as far away from Detroit right now as possible. You don't want to hear anything about the season, about what just happened. You feel frustrated. You feel like professionally you did not come together for two and a half hours in a 17-week season and get one break. That's all it takes, just one win. You couldn't come together with all the training camps, the mini camps, the OTAs, all the film preparation from Monday to, to, to Saturday, getting it all done, putting everything in and not getting it done is unbelievable. They aren't able to get one win. They're a blooper now. They, are, they literally are a blooper, and you feel horrible for them because, as you yeah. said, they, they live in this area. They work in this area. The guy, a lot of them have to yeah, come back you know and what? play the, for the, that. The guy who should be answering questions right now is not there in Matt Millen. That's yeah. the guy who should be answering the question. Absolutely. They did get it right with Calvin Johnson. All those receivers they picked, <laughs> they got it right with him. Finally. That guy is a good football player. There was one other firing. 72, 73, 76ers, 74, 75, Washington Caps, the 1916 Philadelphia A's. That is the group of teams the Detroit Lions will join, posting the worst record in their respective sports history. But let's not kid ourselves. Did you remember how bad the Caps were? Or did you even remember that Philadelphia had a team called the Athletics? People are going to remember the Detroit Lions because they are an NFL team, yeah. and it's happened recently, and they're a blooper reel now. Yeah. Uh, how do you move forward? You're right. And, and the one thing to talk about, Everyone in here uh, says he's a stand-up guy. And Marinelli every week came in and gave his honest opinion and what he thought, never backed down, uh, never left his team hanging, didn't throw the team under the bus. Uh, but there is some, has to be some consequences for not winning a football game. And, again, I go back to the guy who should be answering a lot of these questions. Matt Millen's not here right now. Uh, and he's left uh, Marinelli to answer all the questions. I believe this man will have a job next year. I think he'll be the defensive coordinator, maybe the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Go back to where he's comfortable in a setting uh, that needs a coordinator who is not going to give up, who's going to have great passion like Monty Kiffin had. Uh, and, again, this team will be remembered. But, again, there's not going to be a pivotal player because they don't have a standout quarterback. They don't have that running back. It's not going to be pinned on one player. It's going to be an organization issue, which is uh, if there's any glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel for the players, it's not going to be pinned on one player. It's going to be pinned on the organization. The organization needs to step up and, and be better uh, in the offseason to prevent this type of thing from happening again. Different people running the draft next year for the Detroit Lions and as you saw their draft chart there the, the good news for them is they did pull off a good deal this year Roy Williams they're going to get Dallas's number one pick as well as their third and sixth round pick along with the number one overall pick right. so they can stockpile some young Package players and get to, to, don't worry about the quarterback right now yeah don't there's there's guys like Matt Castle out there like Tom Brick don't worry about the big time quarterback right now because if you get him who else are you going to get to build around you need to build the foundation take a page from the Miami Dolphins 
get a couple defensive linemen, a couple offensive linemen, build that football team so you're really ready to go. There is Sam Bradford sitting there getting ready to play in the national championship <laughs> game going, oh my God. <laughs> oh my, my God. Team might, my team might be able to compete <laughs> oh against Oh my line. God. All right, let's take a break. <laughs> weekend marked the first time that Matt Millen has talked about his culpability with the Lions this 0-16 season the past seven plus seasons and all of the football that we have seen here in Detroit coming up in just a moment Jamie Samuelson and Bob Wolnowski will give us their thoughts on what Millen had to say and you were Head of football operations, you, you throw it back on me. I mean, you can say something about the coaching, you can say something about uh, about the players, but inevitably, you know, I'm responsible for them, and so I'm completely responsible for it in my mind. Were you qualified to take that job in the first place? In some areas, yes. In some areas, no. For, certainly from a football point of view, and the X's and O's, and that's something that you study for a long time and you understand, but there's, you know, there's a whole other side to that job. Um, that uh, you have to learn and uh, frankly I, I didn't understand it going in I had to learn it I could give you excuses I'm not gonna do that I can give you explanations to me that's just an excuse after the fact so uh, you take the hit and you move on and how they look at me I know what I am you can say whatever you want about me all right quick turnaround new cast here at the uh, roundtable set Bob Wodowski known from Sports Radio 1130 the fan of the Detroit News Jamie Samuelson the Riff Morning Show and also the Detroit Free Press guys Matt Millen basically saying what I think he had to say what we'd expect him to say you're in charge of this thing you have to take full blame and was he qualified for the job that's a tough question to answer when you just went 0 16 you really can't come out and say yes I was Bill Parcells qualified right. <laughs> I mean it was a bit of a mea culpa um, it, I did think it was a little odd for him to show up as a quote-unquote expert on an NFL play, uh, playoff game already the one thing that I would have liked, and it wouldn't have made a difference in the grand scheme of things I would have liked to have heard him beat himself up a little bit more and just say I really feel bad about what happened in Detroit, what I did there, and I feel bad for Lions. And Lions. I know the national audience doesn't care about there, but I would have liked to see a little bit more of self-flogging. But see, I don't think that would have mattered. I mean, you've done it on the radio show. I've done it. You know, what could Matt Millen say to make you feel better? Nothing short of I, I quit. I and he didn't quit. He was fired. So there's, there's such a level of anger with Lions fans towards everybody involved with this mess. And Matt Millen and Mr. Ford are one and one A. So that if he sat there and said, I'm really sorry, Detroit, I shouldn't have done it, whatever, it's still, sorry, there's yeah. nothing he could have said. Man, I think it plays differently here in Detroit than it does in other places. People here are mad, and they're going to remain mad at Matt Millen, regardless of what happens, and rightfully so, because of what's happened with his football team. But at the same time, you know, I've heard people say, and you alluded to it a little bit, that maybe he doesn't belong on TV. Look, people that run networks don't care. Oh, He's right. good at what he does. He was considered totally. probably second best to John Madden when yeah. he left the booth. People are going to want to get him back in the booth. And I think it, you, if you look at some of the people that are served up on a weekly basis doing TV games, you can easily see where he could get slotted in. Oh, absolutely. And listen, he's entitled to go earn a living, and, and, and he will no, do. you want him to well, sit at home and be a No, pumper. no, no, no. <laughs> he, he's perfectly entitled to do that. And I will add this, Dan. I think nationally the whole credibility issue will not be that big of a deal. I agree. The Lions are looked at as just this pit where anybody who fell into the pit would get stained by it. Even though Millen is very, very culpable, I think nationally his credibility will probably be pieced together fairly quickly. And if Martin Mayhew can get promoted off an 0-16 season to become a full-time GM, why can't Matt Millen be an analyst off an 0-16 season? Which I mean, is, is it really that hard? Which leads to the next point <laughs> back here uh, as Matt Millen moves into TV again. Uh, you have Martin Mayhew, Tom Lewan looking for a head coach. Chris Mortensen reported today. Jim Schwartz and Mike Malarkey appear to be the top two guys. Look, I, I respect Mort. I don't put a lot into that, not saying those guys won't be the guys. But it appears that this list is long. Right. And I think trying to derive at this point who the favorite is or who the two favorites might be is a little foolish. It, it is. And the list should be long. Now, I mean, with the mayhew Lawan thing, let's just let's put it to bed and let's just be brutally honest here. They didn't earn the jobs and they didn't deserve the jobs. They didn't, based on that. But that doesn't mean they can't do the job. It, does, it doesn't. I mean, I would argue very easily that Martin Mayhew is more qualified now than Matt Millen was eight years ago. That said, I, I'm a little bit nervous about what they're going to do. They're clearly not going after one of the big names. I, I really like Eric Mangini. And 
Mike Shanahan. But well, you, I don't you think know at this point Mike that the sexy thing to say is that the big name thing is overplayed. When you look at what happened in Baltimore, you look at what happened exactly. in Atlanta, exactly, and you look at what happened in Miami. Granted, they had Parcells, Parcells pulling the strings, though, Parcells. but nonetheless, nobody had ever heard of Tony Sperano. I, I think the overarching lesson that Lions fans learned from the whole Matt Millen era is that it's all about personnel. I mean, Steve Mariucci, I still think is a pretty good coach. I know a lot of people still think Rod Marinelli is a good coach. He's probably going to get a new job in Chicago in the next couple days. I, I'm not going to say or just hire anybody. Hire Wojo to be the next head coach, but are you qualified? Barely. As much as Matt Millen was, it's <laughs> all on Martin Mayhew. It's all on Martin Mayhew. I mean, the sole focus should be on him from now on. Yeah. Who he hires is not that and important. You know what? And I'm willing to I, say I, this. I think that's a great point because it doesn't matter who the head coach is. If this roster doesn't improve, exactly. Not win. And, yeah. he, and Martin Mayhew, forgetting how they got the job, let's move on. He may be a, 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 turned out to be a pretty sharp GM. We don't know that. Forgetting how he got the job, and I'm not saying that. that <laughs> that's that hard people, to do. And I, I understand. Yeah. I'm not saying that people should just buy in on blind faith he's got the job right now it's up to him it doesn't matter whether people think he should have it or not in life you're given right. opportunities then it's about what you do with it you look there's skepticism all around him, but at the end of the day, he will be judged by his actions because his actions will dictate winning and losing. Exactly. He seems like a smart guy. That's that's a decent place to start. A little seems defensive, like a little defensive, but I agree with you. He seems like a smart guy. All right, we'll come back with these guys in just a bit. We'll talk some wings. We'll talk some Spartans and some NFL playoffs. Stick with us. We're coming right back on the works after this. Welcome back. Among mixed reviews this week, the Lions promoted Tom Lewan to team president and Martin Mayhew to general manager. Both men have been in the organization during the past eight years. However, both say they feel like they can turn it around. It's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Look at a team that was 0-16, and, and that's in the past. We go forward, uh, but to be able to have the opportunity to turn that team around and make that team a championship team is something special. Um, and I believe we have the capability of being able to, uh, to uh, get that done. Both LaJuan and Mayhew worked under Matt Millen. Many Lions fans think this is a big mark against them. And don't judge me by who my friends are or, or how I got here. Judge me by, by my actions, you know. And that's, you know, to me, at the end of the day, that's, that's what it's about. It's about what happens here. One of the great lessons that I would never wish upon anybody going through an 0-16 season is finding out the character of people in the building, whether that's the locker room, the coaching staff, the front office, the scouting department. We learned a tremendous amount of, about the people we have in this building, and there are a lot of very good ones. With so many names floating around out there, neither LaWanda or Mayhew would discuss a lead candidate to replace Rod Marinelli. It's an internal search. Uh, Martin and I are, are conducting it. Uh, and it began in earnest yesterday, as I said, with the, the uh, uh, request that we sent out to several clubs. And we're scheduling interviews right now, and they'll, they'll begin this week. I think you have to have a head coach who agrees with your philosophy. I think that's part of it. I think that's where we struggle some here in the past. You know, I, I think uh, sometimes it hasn't always matched up what we're doing offensively and what we're doing defensively and what our president and CEO's philosophy was versus what we were trying to do on the football field didn't always match up. The Lions already announced that some ticket prices will freeze and others will drop, but more needs to be done to regain fans' faith in the team. Our words are just that. The thing that we can say to our fans out there is not that our words are going to change 0-16. Our actions are going to change 0-16. Well, the man who left the Lions in shambles made a guest appearance last night on Wild Card Saturday right here on NBC. Yes, former Lions president and CEO Matt Millen sat down with Dan Patrick to discuss his response to the first winless team in NFL history. What was your reaction to that 0-16? Oh, it was brutal. You know, obviously knowing everybody up there and being so intimate and knowing, understanding the details and then watching it unfold, it was... It was probably harder watching it from home than it was when you were up there because at least when you're up there, you have some interaction. At home, you're just sitting there and your wife just keeps on beating on you, so it's tough. What? Uh, how responsible were you for this season and uh, the last eight years there? Oh, completely responsible. I mean, when you were head of football operations, you, you throw it back on me. I mean, you can say something about the coaching. You can say something about... Uh, about the players, but inevitably, I'm responsible for them, and so I'm completely responsible for it in my mind. Were you qualified to take that job in the first place? In some areas, yes. In some areas, no. Certainly from a football point of view, and the X's and O's, and that's something that you study for a long time and you understand, but there's, you know, there's a whole other side to that job um, that uh, you have to learn, and uh, frankly, I, I didn't understand it going in, and I had to learn it. Still ahead on Sports Final Edition, Michigan State closes out the 
Detroit. It's now Jim Schwartz's responsibility to turn around the Lions on Friday. The team introduced him as their new head coach. Schwartz signed a four-year deal worth about 11 million bucks. And during the press conference, he shared about his upbringing, talking about the lessons that he learned from his father, who was a Baltimore policeman. I'm a blue-collar kid, and uh, I'm glad to be here in Detroit. And uh, hopefully, um, we'll, we'll put a team on the field that, uh, that Detroit will be proud of. You'll be proud of the way we play. I can't speak of the past. You know, I'm here right now. I'm not here to, um, you know, to exercise any ghosts. There's no better, better feeling in football than turning a situation around. That's what, that's what drives me here. Sports officially took over as the head coach on Friday. We sat down and talked to him. I asked him if he had any trepidation about taking over a team that was coming off an 0 and 16 season. The NFL is, is about challenges. There's no better feeling than turning something around. I've said before, I know a lot of coaches that have Super Bowl rings. I don't know any that wear them. The reason is because it's not about what you've done in the past. It's what you're, what you're about to do, and it's the future, and I think that's the challenge. That said, what did you have to learn about this organization? Because you know what it is to be in a winning organization. You've been in, in one of the best down in Tennessee, one of the most consistent. What did you have to learn about this organization to say, yes, it's right, and yes, I can be a part of a turnaround there? You know, a lot of it was with my eyes and ears. In my eyes, what I saw in person, um, with my ears, from talking to other people that I respect greatly throughout the NFL. Um, kept coming back with, you know, I, I kept finding a reason not to be interested in the job, and I kept coming back with, um, you know, w w without that reason. And, uh, you know, I think it's important for, you know, for front office and for coaching staff to be on the same page. Um, you know, I think I think we'll have that here. Did you study this roster? Was it important what was in place here before you took the job? Or, or is that not a significant part of becoming an NFL head coach? Because, like you said, you're looking forward, not back. You know, um, I did study the roster, but only because we played the Lions on Thanksgiving this year. And, um, you know, I think it, it you, you want to see talent, but it doesn't make you shy away from it. You know, um, you know, you will start to get an idea. You know, maybe over the next, you know, three or four months of really evaluating the team. Um, it was interesting to hear Martin and Tom's views of the team um, and the talent level. And you know, quite honestly, if we didn't see eye to eye on that, that might have that might have been a reason for me not to take it. But I think we saw the the same things, and you know, it just it just it it, it is about the challenge. I don't think it would have dissuaded me from taking the job. You know, Jim. 0-16. I mean, th this has hit the fan base here hard. Around the league, it's become a laughing stock. Uh, it would seem like a very big mountain to climb. Is it as big as it would look coming off the worst season in the history of the NFL, or do you look at it as this thing can turn around quickly? You talked about the tough times you went through in Tennessee. The, the only way to handle something like that, you said, you know, the mountain or, you know, the, the challenge is to take one step at a time. You know, a couple of years ago, we had the worst defense in the National Football League. We were ranked 32. Um, were they know? trying to ride you out of Nashville? Oh, yeah, we had a lot of websites <laughs> devoted to get me fired, but, you know, we, we persevered through it. We got better, and, and we, we righted that ship, and, um, you know, I, I think anytime you look at a task like that, if you look and say, we have to turn around 0-16, um, you know, it, you're, you're probably not going to be successful. If you take it one step at a time and you say, hey, we're going to get better today, we're going to get better tomorrow, the next day, then you'll look back sometime from now and say, yeah, we were able to get out of it. You mentioned Bill Belichick. You mentioned Jeff Fisher. They're clearly two of the more consistent coaches. They are held up uh, above many of the others as, as being successful in the National Football League. Their track record dictates that. They're your mentors. What do you take from them? How, did, how does what they taught you play into the turnaround you plan here? Uh, I, th I think you hit on the right word, consistent. I think if you ask anybody that's coached with me in the past, if you ask any of the players that have played for me in the past, you'll hear that word come up a lot, consistent. Um, you know, my message doesn't change. I do the same things day in and day out. Um, you know, and I think players find a lot of comfort in that, co in that consistency. I'll, honestly, I'll, I'll be a lot harder on our team when we win than when we lose. I think the head coach's job is to, is to steer a steady course. And when things are going real well, bring the team back down to earth. You know, and when, when things aren't doing well, 
you know, sort of pump them up a little bit. And, you know, I think those two guys, Jeff Fisher and Bill Belichick, in completely different personalities, they both provide those franchises with incredible consistency. What is your message to the fans as you take this job? For the, for the first time since the Lions moved to Ford Field this past season, this building wasn't sold out. There were, there were five games that were blacked out. They weren't on TV. And, and clearly that shows uh, that the fans need something to sink their teeth into before they're going to come back. As you take over, as you begin to, to move this ship in the right direction, what's your message to them? Um, probably is I'm as passionate about what I do as they are. Um, I think that's, uh, there's, you know, th th this is my life. I've, I've chosen to make it my profession. Um, you know, I, as I said before, I don't have a great work ethic because I work 100 hours a week. I do it because I love it. Um, and if they can see that same passion in me, I think they'll, they'll, they'll start believing. All right, guys, we, we have been through this before, certainly with the Lions, where a new coach comes <laughs> in. And, and look, anybody can talk. Anybody can right. say the right things. And anybody can, can sell you standing up on a podium. Here's one thing that I like about Jim Schwartz, because I think that it is the way that you have to approach it. There's not a magic carpet ride that's going to take you out of here. This is going to be if it turns around a process of making right decision after right decision after right decision and then as you add those up you'll look up and say you know what all of a sudden you're a pretty good football team yeah look i was impressed with him i thought you, those introductory press conferences terry we've all been through them marty didn't make a very good impression did mm -hmm. he marty morningwig and rod marinelli really didn't either he kind of looked like a simpleton up there i thought jim schwartz said a lot of good things i thought he said the right things uh, martin mayhew i think is saying the right things and at least they seem to have some kind of base plan that's beyond what the Matt Millen plan seemed to be from day one, which was, we'll throw this up against the wall and see whether it sticks. Now, obviously, the whole thing about the same page, that started to get to me a little bit, because what page are they going to be on? We'll have to find that out. Well, didn't, didn't Marinelli or Millen said that when I start a sentence, Marinelli finishes it? That doesn't right, matter. Yeah. But here's why Lion fans should be excited. One, you're going to have a president slash general manager who's going to treat this as a full-time job rather than the part-time job. Uh, you have a coach that's not coming in here running, you know, gimmick offenses, gimmick defenses. The first thing he said is, hey, look, I'm going to look at my personnel and make a decision on what I am going to do. So that should, that should be exciting for each other. And this guy, he seems, look, it wasn't a circus at the press conference. Right. And it wasn't the bore is high or there's no, there, there's or no, any gim of that there's stuff. no gimmicks with him. I, I mean, look, I, I, I'm nobody can make a guarantee where this is going, but it doesn't seem to be a guy who's going to come out there and try to tell you, sell you snake oil. He yeah. just seems like a football guy who believes that that you figure out a way to win, and you're not going to try to to jam the the round peg into the square hole. I, I talked to one of my guys, uh, NFL sources. The worst thing he said about him is sometimes Schwartz is a little bit arrogant, thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. Well, guess what, buddy? You are going to be show the smartest NFL, guy in the room. <laughs> show me an NFL coach that doesn't think he's the smartest guy in the room most of yeah, the time. Yeah, I'll show you not a very good NFL coach. Yeah, yeah. But the one thing I, I, I did think was good, he seemed to get it about this town a little bit. Maybe Baltimore is a very similar town to Detroit where he was raised. So maybe he got it a little bit. But I don't think he's going to try to snow anybody based on that. And, and people around here, they want to see progress. They want to see sincerity. They want to see honesty. They really haven't seen that for a while from the Lions. And this guy seemed to present himself that way. Well, I will guarantee this. He's going to have a higher winning percentage than any coach under the Matt Millen era. Mark it. Chalk it down. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, we talked in that piece about, about mountains to climb. That, that, that would be a foothill. <laughs> Guys, when, when you look at where this team goes, I do think that we'll get an indication of what's going on with this organization once free agency starts. They've kind of indicated they're not going to go after the big tickets. But there's still a way to make a dent in free agency by bringing in good good football players that can contribute to your team. You don't have to. Look, I would love to see him sign Albert Hainsworth, but it may not happen. you got to get good quality football players. Well, Albert Hainsworth is not going to come here. No, my point yeah, being, I mean, I'd I'm, love to see the big right. splash. However, the key is get better players. If you get somebody to come to the Lions, it means other teams aren't necessarily looking at him because all things being equal, they're not going to come to it. You know what, Dan, the fact that you mentioned free agency first, I'm glad you're not in charge. If they're going to do it, it's got to be through the draft. Forget Hangsworth and all these other only guys. The only reason I said it is free agency starts before the draft. And, and you can't it, ignore it. You can't ignore it. Yes, you, you can. You, you can't ignore it. You've got the to find, draft, Dan. You can the find draft. some good young players and bring them in. Look at him jumping up and down. Yeah, Hangsworth is only 45 and the best we'll be right back. <laughs> ah, this will fix it. The Detroit Lions are tackling next season with a new sleeker. 
more aggressive look. The team strutted its new logo in front of fans at Dunham Sports in Madison Heights this afternoon. We caught up with some fans who say, hey, they love this new look here. I'm glad they didn't change it too much. I like the old one, but I like the new one just as much. It looks a little bit better with the details and the font. I like that too. It's animated. It's tough. It's got, uh, it's got fangs. It's got claws. It's got some ferociousness. It's, it kind of sends that message that, that, that you might not want to come into Ford Field and mess with it. Let's just hope that's true, huh? Now, if you take a look at this new look, you can pick up some of the Lions' new merchandise at local Dunham sports stores. The new logo, though, is not sitting all that well with some Channel 7 viewers. One viewer writes, for instance, let me know when they unveil a new owner. Until then, I'm not spending a dime on Lions tickets, let alone merchandise with or without the new logo. Another viewer writes, the logo, pretty much the same. All roar, no bite, same result. If you'd like to comment, just log on to our website at WXYZ.com and sound off but we do like our lions yes we do and I over the NFL, the Lions have a new look, and according to their team president, it will coincide with a new direction. Jennifer Hammond has more. Jason Hansen has witnessed plenty of change since he was drafted by the Lions in 1992, but this marks the first time the Lions kicker has seen a new logo, and he was overwhelmed by the fan support. <laughs> You know, to come out for the unveiling of a new logo and um, on a rainy Monday, on a rainy Monday and stuff. I mean, it really is incredible. The fans here. I really feel like this is this is the start of a new beginning. You know, we we got to turn we got to turn this culture around. We got to turn this team around. And a lot of that depends on what the Lions do with their first overall pick in this weekend's draft, which the fans weren't shy about expressing opinions on. When last season ended and the new season began that we wanted to do more and more of uh, and this is a great opportunity to do that and, and we want to hear their opinions and we want to hear the fans. It sounds like everybody wants Curry to be the number one draft choice. I hope he likes that too and we all get a percentage of his contract. For the hundreds of fans that came out to Madison Heights today to see the logo unveiling, most of them said that they're pleased with what they saw but obviously it's all going to take a new product on the field to really impress them. It's exciting because I think, I think they realize it's bad as this organization has been over the years, you know, where we sell out Ford Field, we sold out the Silverdome. It's great fans. I don't know if there's better fans in the country. For me, it's a new direction. Look, you know, I'm glad that, you know, the season's behind us. We got a new head coach and we got new uniforms to go along with a new season. In Madison Heights, Jennifer Hammond, Fox 2 Sports. Is going to be the first overall pick of this draft, meaning that nine of the last 12 first overall picks will be quarterbacks the Detroit Free Press with a banner headline in its sports section Stafford is a lion and what a price the Lions put on Matthew Stafford it is a fat six year contract worth upwards of 70 million with 41.7 million of it guaranteed meaning we have officially reached the stage in which a player who's never been in the NFL before makes more guaranteed money than anyone else in the league we'll talk about that Still to come on this five-hour pre-draft broadcast that starts in Detroit. Solomon Wilcox is on Lions Cam with the latest. Solomon. Well, Rich, the Detroit Lions are anything but cheap. Remember, they could have had Wake Forest linebacker Aaron Curry for a guaranteed $30 million, but they decide to spend that and a whole lot more on quarterback Matthew Stafford. As you mentioned the numbers, Six years, $78 million, over $40 million guaranteed. That's $11 million more in guaranteed money than the first overall pick in last year's draft. Now, Matthew Stafford becomes only the second quarterback for the Detroit Lions to hail from Highland Park High School in Dallas, Texas. The last quarterback to play for the Detroit Lions who went to Highland Park High School in Dallas was none other than Bobby Lane, who helped the Detroit Lions win their last NFL championship some 50 years ago. So they go right back to the same high school, and hopefully this time they come up roses with Matthew Stafford. All right, Solomon, stay right there. Obviously, we'll be going to you uh, early and then often with the Lions picking 20th overall in this draft as well. Let's leave the money aside for a moment. Mike Mayock, is this the right pick for the Detroit Lions with the first overall pick? In my opinion, no. And, and my reasoning is this. A year ago, I would have banged the table at number one for Matt Ryan, and I did. This year, after watching a ton of tape, talking to a lot of people about this kid, I just see too many inconsistencies in his game. So in my opinion, you're sitting there at number one, and instead of trying to hit the grand slam, which they're trying to do, if this kid turns out great, that's fine. If he doesn't, 
This franchise is set back for the next five years, given the amount of guaranteed money. I'd much rather try and hit a double and take one of those tackles, which historically, first round tackles are a safer pick. We know there's no such thing as a safe pick. They are a safer pick. I'd have gone with one of the tackles and look for my quarterback later. Well, the, the tackles are a safer pick, Mike, and Aaron Curry would have been $10 million less to sign him if they chose him yeah. first. But we all know franchises need a quarterback to get to the promised land, all right? And they haven't had one. The last Pro Bowl quarterback they've had was 37 years ago. They need a quarterback. They've been searching for years. Now, they probably had to choose between uh, Mark Sanchez and Matthew Stafford. Stafford's got the strongest arm in the draft. He's the only guy that throws the ball 60 miles an hour. All the other guys in the draft groups are 52 to 58. 52 is like your arm, okay? <laughs> but this guy's smart. 38 on the Wonderlick, Rich, that's even higher than you. Yes. So he's strong and he's smart. And you know what? You're putting a lot of eggs in one basket, but yeah. he's a good kid. I'll tell you what, I don't have 41 million reasons to take the guy number one, but I like the pick. I think they need a quarterback. They play in a dome, which is very conducive to throwing it. They got a great receiver from Georgia Tech, by the way, in Calvin Johnson. And in the NFC North, you have Jay Cutler, you have Aaron Rodgers. This is the conference of the young quarterback. And you got to start somewhere. You're 0-16. Let's get a guy in here that has durability, that can chuck it, man. He can make all the throws. I think it's a great pick for Detroit. And, uh, and that's one of my 41 million reasons. Well, a year ago, the Baltimore Ravens as well as the Atlanta Falcons were sitting in the same situation. And they went with a quarterback a couple days ago. I didn't really like to pick, but the more I got in the hotel room and pondered the thought, this is a fans base league, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fans run this league. They love the league. The fans make us who we are. And you told me yourself, when you played in Detroit, I believe a year ago, wasn't anybody there <laughs> because of no reason for excitement. They were 0-16. It could be a bad pick because this guy might not mature backing up Dante Culpepper, but I think it's a good pick because there is nowhere else to go. You're 0-16. Get him go with an offensive tackle that doesn't excite anyone who wants to go see an offensive tackle play have you ever thought about man i can't wait to go see this tackle play <laughs> no, I, I, no, no, I want to see a team win play i yeah, want to see a, yeah. a winning team play. but you to get fans excited and sell some tickets in this economy i, I think you should go with I, the quarterback. I think it's a That's football the marshall i think it's a football decision. it is and, and and i don't i don't know if it's a good pick or not we don't know that um yeah whether it fits what they want to do. But what I do know is that Martin Mayhew and Jim Swartz, they are attached to a quarterback now. Yep. And this quarterback is either going to take them where Peyton Manning took Bill Polian. We, we look at how they draft and we say, my God, everybody that they draft is good. Well, they draft receivers. And Peyton Manning is throwing to those guys. Guess what? Reggie Wayne is going to be good. Antonio Gonzalez, he's going to be good. Dallas Clark, they are going to be good because Peyton will get them in the right situation. The question is for the Detroit Lions, what are they going to do beyond this first? pick. I, Stafford, whether you like it or not, what else are they going to put around him? Because when you look at this organization, that's all we can do is say, Matt Millen, boy, whew, that guy didn't do a good job. Matt's gone. Who are they going to blame now? Well, I mean, here's the deal. <laughs> Dion, you brought up the two quarterbacks last year, Flacco and Ryan, who were both fifth-year seniors, by the way. Right. Okay. But what they both had going for them is Baltimore ran the football more than any other team in National Football League. A, a they year took ago. pressure a year ago. They took yeah. pressure. Baltimore took pressure off their rookie quarterback. Thomas Dimitrov in Atlanta traded for Michael Turner prior to the draft, and they did a great job running the football and bringing Matt Ryan along. Two special kids that were fifth-year seniors that were protected by a good run game. You're going to take this kid. And you're going to throw him to the Wolves now. This is the number 30 rush team in the league. Mm -hmm. Okay, they gave up 52 sacks a year ago. You're going to throw a young man in, in the middle of this unless you start Culpepper, okay? And then you're going to get the fan base all riled up for $41 million sitting his butt on the bench. Well, I, I, I know I we got it. Rich, I know we got to get back to you. No, no, but no, you don't have to do that. But <laughs> you understand Matt Ryan went number three for a reason because the Atlanta Falcons were hot garbage a year ago. So well, we this is an afterthought that we're saying, yeah, they had a running game. They didn't have a well, running no, game before but, but last what did, year. What did I preface my whole comment on? I said Matt Ryan and Joe Flacco were fifth-year seniors, and I banged the table last year for Matt Ryan because the kind of kid he is in addition to what he brings to the table on the football field. I can't go that far with Matthew Stafford off tape. He doesn't have the accuracy, footwork, or, or when you break his tape down, he differs from quarter to quarter, let alone game to game. And he had all kinds of weapons around him that none of these other quarterbacks had. When we have five hours to discuss this, right. uh, 
putting just a button on it for the moment, I think they have no choice but to start Matthew Stafford week one. You got, you got to. I mean, they have no choice but to do it. I mean, you're 0-16, mm. and you can't get any Look worse. Look at the coaches over here shaking their I heads. know, and we're going to discuss that <laughs> along again with the astronomical guaranteed money giving to a player who's never played in the NFL before throughout this five-hour pre-draft edition of NFL. And I'm Total coming Access. at Mike May last 10 number one overall picks in the draft including Matthew Stafford only two people on this list two guys on this list have won a playoff game one works across the river in New Jersey one is currently in Leavenworth that is the pure facts about who has done what with the first overall pick in the draft Mike Mayock and you got a chance to meet with the latest number one overall pick in the draft in Matthew Stafford. Recently. You know what, Rich? Last summer, I had the opportunity to travel down to Athens, Georgia. I sat down. I watched some tape with Matthew Stafford. What I loved is he lit up when he started talking about the game of football. After we got done with the tape piece, we got up at the grease board. Let me tell you something. I was impressed. It's third and 12. Mm -hmm. Late in the fourth quarter. Ball's on the minus 40-yard line. You guys are down six. You got to get a first down. If Coach Rick calls timeout, Matthew, what do you want to run? Walk me through the play. We got the X over here, our uh, weak side receiver, stemming up, pushing vertical, and running a read route. We've got our tight end pushing up to help hold the wheel and let the corner sink in a little bit. And then he's going to run pretty much a wheel route. Over here, we got the same concept going. Uh, this guy going here and out. And uh, our Z receiver coming in and up. These corners are going to be pretty aggressive with a jam. And these safeties really like to get off the hash because they know they got this Mike linebacker as the run through to play the deep middle of the field. If it happens as you're calling, it is a Tampa 2. Mm -hmm. Where are you throwing the football? Well, I'm looking strong because the Mike is usually going to open up to the three receiver side. So I'm going to look the Mike to the field to try to open up this window over here. I'm gonna get my eyes over the free safety. Probably end up hitting this X, it, it works. You know, I'm thinking it's more the X, right? Not. Because yeah. you've got nothing holding him. Right. You're not high low in him. Exactly, you right. know, we're just keeping this guy here to take him out, right. and we're working one-on-one, -on -one, and lots of times when a guy comes in and stems up, he's going back out, and we, you know, give him a good move, throw it over there, taking a three-step drop and throwing it right here to our X. Well, I've really had fun in Athens, George. I want to thank Matthew Stafford for spending the time with me. He throws the deep in-breaking route as well as any college quarterback I've ever seen in my life. And, guys, when you start talking about evaluating a quarterback, I think we can all look at, at arm strength, and I think that's where the biggest mistakes get made is just overemphasizing what a big arm needs. But accuracy, footwork, and I think really important to me, is if I'm going to take a guy in the top 10 as a quarterback, I want to know what kind of kid he is when there's fire in the pocket. I want to know if he's in early watching tape. Is he, is, is he lifting weights with the offensive lineman? Is he taking him out to dinner? There's a lot to evaluating a quarterback, Mooch. Well, you just said it. There's a lot to evaluating a quarterback. I think, personally, it's the toughest position to play, not just in football, but in all of sports. He's the baseball pitcher that pitches every game. He's the point guard in basketball that's got to beat the press on every possession. It's not only the toughest to play, it's the toughest to evaluate, Groots, because there are so many uh, qualifications. Let's start with physical qualifications. Can he throw, make all the throws? Can he run? What kind of foot speed does he have in making plays with his arm and his legs? Then there's mental capabilities that are off the charts. He better be a smart guy. Now, Stafford's a 38 wonderlick, but he proved to be a smart guy on the board. And then there's some intangible. Can he be a leader? Does he have stage presence? There's, there's, there's a, all those types of things that you just can't really predict. So that's why it's such a crap shoot. Well, it's hard to evaluate that in a 21-year-old player. Right. It's easier to evaluate it in a Rich Gannon who's 33 or 34 because right. you know he leads the NFL in guts. Right. Brad Johnson, you know, he leads the NFL in guts. Jeff Garcia. But when you're drafting a guy that's 21 years old, it's hard to measure what's inside of some of these guys. Right. Because you don't know their offense. You don't know what their true potential is in terms of leadership because they're, they've never really been in that position. But I think it's a tough position to play, man. It's a tough position to evaluate, but you got to do the best you can to evaluate the physical skills, and you got to learn as much as you can about that guy above the neck, see what he stands for, see how much he loves it, and just get a feel from his teammates how he reacted with them while he was at school. Yeah, and, and we're living proof how tough it is to evaluate because between the three of us, we got two Super Bowls, a whole bunch of wins. 
And instead of sitting in some draft room, we're sitting here evaluating the draft because <laughs> we couldn't evaluate or we couldn't develop a quarterback to, enough to, to get our programs over the hump or to save our jobs, so to speak. I think the biggest problem is if, if you were to sit here and we were just to decide, okay, each of us, pick the 10 greatest quarterbacks of all time. And, and we all have our list. Now tell me why they're so good. Tell me why they're great. When you listen to the strengths of what made Troy Aikman great versus Joe Montana versus Marino versus you go back to the, uh, to the Roger Staubach or you go to Johnny Unite, whatever it is, it's, it's funny because it's a different skill set for each guy that made them great. And that's why it's so hard to quantify and why it we say it's a 50 50 crapshoot on taking a quarterback in the first round. It's, it's more like 30, 30 to 70 since 1990. There's been 43 first round quarterbacks taken. And by any measurement, only 14 of them have been any good. It's a crapshoot when you take a quarterback in the first round. I think there's a lot of things you look at here. All college players to pro players, it's a projection. The greatest projection is quarterback. Why? First of all, speed of the game. In college, you're throwing to receivers that are wide open, that aren't challenged. You have to get, be pinpoint with your accuracy, fit the ball in tight spots in the NFL. Secondly, how much pressure do you face in college from a pass rush? Not an awful lot. All of a sudden, you got better coverage, you got more of a pass rush. You're projecting things that you're not really seeing on tape. Then the mental aspect. How smart are you to handle a complex pro system? You can run them through all the tests, and I've had the experience of running through all the tests. Some guys, you can figure them out. Some guys, you can't figure them out until you get to here. Then the other thing, you can't dismiss this. What about the cast around them? You go into a team that isn't very good. You could take a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers. How successful would Aaron Rodgers be if he went with San Francisco and the team didn't develop quite around him? The system we have now is not conducive to developing quarterbacks. You had quarterbacks go first a lot recently. That wasn't the case. Why? In the past system, before free agency, you could sometimes find guys in the middle round. They sat for three or four years. They become better players. You got Terry Bradshaw, Steve Young, Phil Simms. None of them were successful early. In today's system, they'd be busts, not Hall of Famers. Phil Simms, I'm voting for him, but a Hall of Fame. He always beat us in Washington anyway. <laughs> you know, when I, look, when I look at these guys, they, they have intangibles, and you can measure that. But the thing for me, because I was in the huddle with the Peyton Manning his rookie year when he threw 20-some-odd interceptions. The thing is, it's that moxie, and you know it. They command the respect. They look you in the eye. They tell you the truth, and they will lead you. And you feel comfortable with that guy. And when you talk about all these first-round picks, the guys that are in the league, the guys that have won the Super Bowl, the, guy that's, the guys that have been successful, they all have that. And if you talk to their receivers or their running backs or their offensive linemen, those guys were willing to do whatever it takes to keep that guy upright because when he threw the football and took a hit, he didn't have nothing to say to you. And you respected him for that. All of the guys, Kurt Warner, um, uh, Peyton Manning, those guys are the kind of guys, Mark Bolge even had it in him. Those guys have those little intangibles that make you want to play for them, make you want to keep them upright, make you want to get that extra block to give them a, enough time to, to help you win the football game. I, I do agree those intangibles goes a long way. And uh, Mr. Mayock does a wonderful job of sc scouting these guys and giving us all those. And do they have the big arm? Do they have the moxie? Can they put it up on the board? But this is one of the, the few positions in the game that you need other people. A cornerback, I don't care who's out there rushing, you could cover. Defensive linebacker, offensive guys as well, but a quarterback. And I always wonder why they made a big deal out of the big three in Dallas. You know, and they won the three Super Bowls. But when one of those three guys, Emmett, Chor, or Mike Urban wasn't available, they didn't play together, they didn't have success. Let's look at all the, the top quarterbacks around the league. When you talk about a Peyton Manning, you have a Dallas Clark. You may have a Reggie Wayne out there, also a die. In San Diego with Rivers, you, in the backfield, you got LT, and you got Gates right there. It's almost like a triangle. You got to give these guys a triangle to be successful. It's very tough with any of these guys. When we mentioned Joe Montana, we, we could think about two or three guys that were right there. Every successful quarterback we mentioned, it was almost a perfect triangle helping him and assisting him but, throughout but, the process. But Brian Billick said that we've got old coaches that have been evaluating quarterbacks. You, Coach Gruden, I think lead our staff in evaluating quarterbacks. <laughs> many, people, many people thought that you just were never happy with your quarterback. Would you say that's well, been said? It's hard to develop the guy. And I don't know how you develop a quarterback if you don't have him on your team. 
And I think <laughs> you, know, you had six. Look at all the rules you have nowadays with uh, <laughs> uh, rosters and all that stuff. If you don't have a guy in training camp or OTAs or in your off-season program, how do you develop them? You can't send them to the World League. There is no World League. You got to give the guy some kind of an opportunity to learn your offense where he can execute it. <laughs> Therefore, I took as many as I could. Yeah, six 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 I never had Troy Aikman there either. Right. You know, so there's. You do what you got to do to survive. And, and Jennifer Love, our director, has her camera trained on you in the Bucks pick. Maybe Josh Freeman with their first overall pick. It'll be exciting, draft. I'll tell you that. <laughs> be exciting. We're going to have that reaction <laughs> shot for you Somebody, right here. Someone else. <laughs> was the first overall pick in the draft got a signing bonus of twelve point two five million dollars or a quarter of the amount of guaranteed money this year's first overall pick in the draft Matthew Stafford is going to get from the Detroit Lions we are about an hour and a half away from the beginning of this National Football League draft when Matthew Stafford will be the first player taken off the board it is a six year deal for Matthew Stafford worth north of seventy million dollars with forty one point seven million of those dollars guaranteed uh, for the highly talented uh, quarterback out of Georgia played at such a high level in the SEC so there's lots of bona fides for this guy but still 41.7 million guaranteed dollars for a guy who's never played at this level before that is more guaranteed money than anybody in the NFL I am from a union household, Mark Jafar, <laughs> and I'm saying this, I'm prefacing this to you. I'm from a union household. Both my parents were New York City public school teachers. Their pensions are uh, flush, knock on wood, right now, thanks to a great union. But I must say, this is ludicrous that there is a system going on right now that somebody who's never played before is making more money guaranteed than anybody else in the league. I'd love to know a player's point of view on this particular subject. Unfortunately, your parents chose the wrong career. In, in, in playing football, when, when you have the first pick, you feel bad for the Lions, but they earned the right to pay this guy the money, and he did the things that he needed to do. He fell into the slot. They fell in love with him. They picked him. Me being the second pick, I don't even feel comfortable if I was him coming into the league getting 41.7 guaranteed. Like, what can you do to earn those dollars? Can you win enough games for an organization? And, and I, I thought the Ford, I thought Ford was in a recession. I mean, I thought the car industry was hurting. Like, do they get a discount? What, what's happening? I don't understand it, Rich. I agree with you to, to a certain extent. Something has to be done because there's veteran players who might not make teams because they can't pay players. And the owners need to find out what they want to do with the money. And they need to come to some sort of agreement so we can fix this because players getting paid this who haven't played it down, it's not fair. Hey, I, I feel the same way. I don't understand it. I don't try to understand it. They have league meetings. They have labor meetings. That's just the way it is. And the guy got a $41 million bonus. The owners, the GMs, Gene Upshaw, it's a credit to him and to Maurice Smith what they've done for players. I think it's just the state of the league. Every year, that number one pick gets more and more money. I don't understand it. Not my job to deal with it. I just say congratulations. Well, I, that's why the, nobody wants that number one pick, nor will anybody trade up to get it. It's too expensive. And Tom Condon has done a nice job negotiating a heck of a contract for his client. He did it last year with Matt Ryan as well. But I, too, feel like it's very unfair for one who hasn't played a down to come in and not only be the highest paid player on the Detroit Lions, but he is one of the highest paid players in the entire league right now. Now, this new collective bargaining agreement, whenever we reach it, the rookie pool is not the only issue. It's one. It's on the back burner, in fact. It's the amount of total dollars that the players will receive. And then of that, hopefully they discuss this time around because Charlie Casserly said, hey, they've been trying to get this changed for years, and they, they kind of push it to the back. Well, the, the rookie pool has got to be lessened. I'm not suggesting like basketball, but these players, especially in the top ten, too high. Pay the veterans who deserve it, and then let the rookies get their money second contract. League's upside down. It's way upside down. Pay on performance, pay on tenure. I wouldn't be surprised today for, for the first time to see a team intentionally not make a pick. Intentionally. <laughs> Very I'm, possible. I'm dead serious. There's some owners out there right now that are saying, wait a minute. If my player personnel guy is telling me that the same guys at 20 as there is at 5, why not just keep passing the pick until your guy comes up, walk up, and save your owner $15 million? Yep. There's a hole in the drafting system, and some point soon, 
somebody's going to take advantage of it. And, and, and the fear, I think, is at some point soon, these fans, these every men and every women that you see here, there'll be a disconnect that these hardworking people are, are wondering how in the world someone can step into a business and make as much money without doing it at all. And I think that, that there's a, a risk that, that the league may run for something like this. No other business that's run this way. And just to let you know how life is changing for Matthew Stafford, I was with him last night at an event uh, for Sprint. And uh, he was going to sit down for a panel discussion with me and Mark Sanchez. And he took his wallet out because he didn't want to sit on his wallet, Costanza style, yep, Costanza. For, for half an hour. So he put his wallet down and said, how much money is in your wallet? He said, one dollar. One dollar. He had one buck in there. And I'm like, tonight's the last night of your life <laughs> where you have one dollar in your wallet. That, that, that's a lot of pressure. When you think about a quarterback, you have to come in and play. And now you have 41 million. And everybody's talking about that. I want some of that pressure. <laughs> S sign me up. Uh, I'm in. You don't want uh, that pressure. Yeah. Luckily, they've got him signed early. Here right. they come, guys. And here are the uh, future millionaires coming off the bus right now. You got Brian Cushion from Jersey. There's Matthew Stafford. And the rest of the crew are coming into the house, just like all the fans and, of course, you at home. Let's uh, get to the headline. Matthew Stafford <laughs> has signed and sealed. He has been delivered to the Detroit Lions. The contract was finalized about 14 hours ago. Matthew Stafford, six years, $78 million if he reaches all of the potential bonuses. The guaranteed money becomes the real number in NFL contracts. That's $41.7 million. The Lions, who have long been searching for a franchise quarterback, essentially have not had a great franchise quarterback at any time in this half century. Hope that they find the answer with Matthew Stafford, who joins this list. Hey, look, whatever the potential is going to be, it's all conjecture. Today, in some day, in some ways, is the day for Matthew Stafford to celebrate joining yes. that list yes. forever. He will be one of the number one overall picks in the history of the NFL draft. Let me go around the table. I'm going to start with Trent here. Just your thoughts on the Lions and their selection of staff. Well, first, I hope he's not satisfied just being on that list. <laughs> right. that, that would tell you too much about him. But, you know, guys, the thing I look at is this is only the right pick if the Lions handle it correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to treat this very specifically. He is not ready to go in there and play. Not only is he not ready, they're not good enough to have him play. That's I mean, you're opening up a whole um, possibility of an absolute train wreck here if you put him in the game too, so too soon. You can't sell him as the savior to the city of Detroit. You can't sell him as the savior to the football team because it's going to heap too many expectations on him, and the pressure is what kills these kids early on in their career. Well, one reason that the fans in Detroit should be excited is because it looks like the team has one direction. All right, they targeted one player, all right? They got him signed, mm -hmm. which was huge for them because they lose their leverage if they draft the player without a contract. Point. So now the di direction of the franchise is set. Mm -hmm. Now, hold him back. Let Culpepper play because this team is not ready to have a rookie quarterback because we can't forget. They did not win a game last year. You know, but he is the savior. He is the Messiah. He's the first pick in the draft. I don't care what the Lions do, how they handle him. To the fans of Detroit, you take a guy with the first pick in the draft, you expect him to be on their field sooner rather than later. Now, I believe he has elite arm strength. I believe he'll be a top-tier NFL quarterback eventually. However, I believe early in the career, you'll see Dante Culpepper out there eight, maybe ten games, allowing the offensive line and the personnel around the Lions offense to come together in Jim Schwartz's system. Well, we, we talked this morning about when he was going to be successful and effective, and we're talking about two or three years down the road. So now it's no longer about the first pick, and, and I'm not naive. You do need to have a quarterback. You're not going where you want to be, which is to the Super Bowls, playoffs. You're not going without one. Now it's all about the other picks. Who do you build around him? Offensive line, opposite wide receiver from Calvin Johnson. What kind of defense? do you play to keep him on the field so now it's about what you do after this that's going to make this the, the pick? right pick or not the right do you pick. agree do you agree it's no exactly. no i would i would have gone okay. uh, another direction well part of what we're looking at here is the detroit lions now a better franchise and josh you said he is the savior because the fans will sell him as a savior what do the good organizations do they don't listen to the fans the good organizations do it they're convicted about doing and don't listen to the fans i'll, well, I'll stop you there the lions no. always early in the draft <laughs> well I'll, I'll stop you there because the fans wanted curry the linebacker out of wake forest mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you say the fans what well, you don't know there's not a straw poll of a hundred thousand <laughs> but when the lions unveiled their new logo on wednesday they were chanting curry's name they wanted mm. curry 
because they saw a defense that gave up point. And the Titans are still scoring on Thanksgiving. Worst day. ever. But what the Lions are trying to do here is front office, president, GM, they're trying to hit the reset button and start over. They, they're trying to do that, but I was driving down the highway when they made an announcement. I think I was listening to your radio show, and my wife said, they're still going to lose. So no, nobody have no confidence. You can't change your logo. You have to change more than your logo in Detroit. Oh, oh absolutely. But you've got to start somewhere. You can't look at the past because if you live off yeah, what happened in the true. past, you're going to get your season so tickets again? Forward. Best I'm occupied on weekends, Chris, unable to. <laughs> <laughs> what, if, what if I could? Kirk Herbstreit watches all the quarterbacks every week. College game day, our lead analyst on college football. Herbie, there's been a conversation with Matthew Stafford and Mark Sanchez out of USC. Just put A and B next to each other and tell us where you think which guy is going to be the better NFL fit. Well, I think down the road, big picture, I think Mark Sanchez eventually is going to be the better pro quarterback. I think Matthew Stafford has tremendous upside physically. He's everything that you would ever want in a, in a franchise-style quarterback. If I were to give an edge, uh, edge to Mark Sanchez, it would be number one. I think he's been tutored for this his entire life. Going to a high school, Mission Viejo, with his coach, Bob Johnson, the way his dad raised him, it's almost like he's been programmed for this. Athletically, he can make the throws all over the place from every Every launching point you want to see and also just the, we always talk about it and Tommy's gonna go crazy here the it factor he has that <laughs> he, whatever it is when you meet him you walk away with a very favorable impression of him now, again not to say that you don't have that with Matthew Stafford there's just something different much like when we talked with Matt Ryan last year you can kind of feel that when you talked with Matt Ryan you get that feeling with Mark Sanchez and I think if you were to give him an edge at this point over Stafford, looking at the big picture, it's mobility, athletic ability, that, that, that ability to take a game over. You can see his body language, where his players react to what he's doing, and that's why I would give Sanchez an edge over Stafford, in my opinion, big picture. Herbie's going to be with us for the next couple of hours. We'll uh, use his expertise in the college game as we get ready, because a lot of you are NFL fans who don't spend a lot of time watching the conference that's not around you, so Kirk and Todd McShay and Mel Kuyper will be able to fill that in as we prepare you for watching the draft. Well. This time last year, in the last few years, Herm Edwards has been in one of the draft rooms trying to help make the right decision, find the it factor, find the can't-miss guy. Well, we didn't miss because Herm is now on our team, and he's sitting with Trey Wingo all weekend in New York, so let's join them now. Trey? All right, Michael, thanks very much. Uh, if anybody knows about coaching, it is Herm Edwards, as you said, not only with the Chiefs, but also with the Jets in this town. He's still the mayor here, by the way, <laughs> walking over today from the hotel. Hey, Herm, Herm, how are you? That's those cab drivers. It's a, a rock star. Money. Well, guys money. <laughs> they'll find you. All right, so you're, let's play for a minute that you're the head coach of the Lions. All right, put yourself in Jim Swartz's shoes. You are the head coach of the Lions. You have Matthew Stafford, number one overall. He's getting millions of dollars. Do you sit him or do you play him? I think you sit him in the fact that they have Dante Culpepper. For me, Dante Pul Culpepper is the key in this. He has the, the ability now to tutor a young quarterback and convince Dante Culpepper that this is your job. I think this guy fits this football team. Uh, the way they're going to throw the ball down the field is very, very important. He's in a system that his ability will show up when he plays football. But I think, again, now at this point, what they need to do, they got to get a tackle to protect the quarterback. Dante especially. If they can get their self a tackle here, uh, they got the quarterback of the second future. First round pick? Exactly right. They got the quarterback of the future, so they're headed in the right direction. So we can call it whatever we want, but I think this kid will fit the system that he's actually going to have to play in for the Detroit Lions. So suddenly Dante Culpepper then becomes the key because how he handles that eventual transition uh, will decide whether or not this is a smooth transition or it's disruptive. Uh, for the Simply put, this was not winning football. I failed. They need to play better football. Winless. They're being soundly beat on both sides of the football. Attitude and effort, that's not the problem with this team. They don't have talent. That's because of so many years of poor drafts. Difficult, frustrating. Um, there's been a lot of embarrassing moments. Joey Harrington, who's a reserve quarterback now for the Saints, is quoted as saying, I didn't realize my time there was the heyday in a franchise. <laughs> I really think today, though, is a new day. It's a new start for us. Glad to be here in Detroit, and uh, hopefully um, we'll, we'll, we'll put a team on the field that, uh, that Detroit will be proud of. 
Hey, look, nobody would wish what happened on the Detroit Lions on anybody. They were 0-16. No team had ever gone 0-16. We all know that. Uh, the expansion Buccaneers, the lovable Bucs, the 1976-0-14 Buccaneers are in some ways washed out of the book. So now the good news is for the Detroit Lions, there is nowhere to go but up. You've seen the new hierarchy. You've seen Martin Mayhew is going to make the picks. You've seen Jim Schwartz, who served for years and years under Jeff Fisher, where he certainly got... Uh, great tutelage but now the lions actually have to set forth a plan they've started out with matthew stafford but what do they do steve how do they build you block by they, block they've got nothing to go but up but they can just stay down like they have they been. could Not, and then you know been you 50 about years get a glass won. half full or half empty well this is a glass with just a couple of drops of water in it this is a team that has the flat on their back now the good news is that you know the, the old saying is an infinite number of monkeys with an infinite number of typewriters you can get war and peace <laughs> sooner or later just like the arizona cardinals you can get the nut and so that's why i think you look at calvin johnson what they have on the receiver now with matthew stafford if these guys are the kind of kids that can take this by the throat and say we are going to drag this team out of this oblivion with a new coach a new general manager make some solid drafts then you got to start saying that they have some hope well, I, I think they do have hope, but like the Arizona Cardinals, they decided to go with a veteran quarterback, and a veteran quarterback got them to the Super Bowl. I, you know, I'm not all gung-ho about the pick with Matthew Stafford. I think that they need players. They need picks. I, in somehow, some way, they should have got out of that number one slot. I don't care what it was. Nobody was it, it doesn't matter. Spot. Figure it out. Figure it out. Me. Try to get you something. played on a 1-15 team. So I, I understand you had Coach Parcells come in the second year. I understand he's a Hall of Famer. But what other than that, what happened in there we, to get we you? Got out of, we got out of that number one slot, Chris, and we got out of there, and we wind up picking up some other players. And Mel, you would know whether or not this guy better than me because you've studied him longer if he can make this team a, a playoff contender two years from now eventually be not right away and certainly the second year is asking a lot for a team to build from 0 and 16 to playoff contention i think if you handle him properly you let him sit watch and learn dante culpepper you have the 20th pick you have the 33rd pick you have opportunities to build up this team you have the remaining draft picks to do that so another draft next year i think by year three it's realistic to think with Stafford now settling in and the town coming up around him, you maybe could be a playoff team. When you look at Matthew Stafford, and I said this from the get-go, the arm strength is pretty obvious. Now, that's not all it takes to play quarterback in the NFL. We see guys with big arms. Hey, bust out. This kid has elite arm strength. He's got an attitude to learn. He improved every year in the program at Georgia. He won a lot of games, three straight bowl games. And you watch his arm. He makes one throw a game. I said this from day one that nobody else can make. And he had receivers this year with Mohamed Massacre on A.J. Green, but his offensive line was very young. Pinpoint accuracy, not always there, but they're paid to catch the football. And I think that's what wide receivers are there to do. And you see it there. Young receiver makes the catch. Decision-making, I thought, got better. Feet in the pocket. They work on that. Quarterback coach will have to include that aspect. You watch him here. Force the ball into double coverage. Hey, NFL quarterbacks will do that. His touchdown interception ratio got better as he moved along at Georgia. Bottom line is, when you look at Matthew Stafford, let him redshirt. He's not a senior. Don't expect him to be Matt Ryan. Move him in late in year one or in early in uh, year two. We would like to welcome those of you that have watched New Orleans and Charlotte in their opening round. Since about Halloween last year, 0-16 earned them the first pick. And guess what? Okay. They've decided. With the first pick in the 2009 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Matthew Stafford, quarterback, Georgia. It begins today for Matthew Stafford and the Detroit Lions. Three of the last four number one overall picks have been signed before the draft. Nine of the last 12 years, last year being an exception, the number one pick, going back to 98 when Peyton Manning was the number one pick, nine of the 12 years have seen a quarterback pick first overall. Now Matthew Stafford from Georgia, arm strength as he meets the commissioner, 
we meet Matthew Stafford now officially in the National Football League. Now watch this long one. Yeah, right on the money. Now he can also move some in the pocket. He'll float one to the back of the end zone. Nice move. And he throws it. So he can make that throw every now and then, Mel. Right? That just goes, wow. And what you're seeing here, Boom, is the supporting cast. That's no Sean Moreno making a big catch in the end zone. A.J. Green, the true freshman sensation. You see the athleticism and the mobility for a kid 6'2 and a quarter, pushing 230 pounds. 61% was his completion percentage this past year. The offensive line was young and inexperienced, Boom. So don't think he had, yeah, he had skill people, but the offensive line wasn't top notch, and he still put up big numbers, and he won three straight bowl games, and the kid will compete hard if you coach him properly. I'm not saying he's Hall of Fame. He should be a very good starting quarterback in this league, and that should be good enough for the Detroit Lions. Well, I'd love to hear your comments, Steve, and Key. You've been in this exact position, but hey, it's Matthew Stafford's moment. He's back in the green room with our Aaron Andrews. Good afternoon, Aaron, and congratulations, Matthew. All right, Chris, thank you. Congratulations to you. Thank you you just told me back there you love a challenge. Well, here's a little bit of <laughs> one for you. The Lions, they haven't had a Pro Bowl quarterback since 1971. What kind of pressure does that put on you? Oh, that's a little bit, but, you know, I'm, I'm ready to play football. That's that's the best part about this. I get a chance to play for a great organization and, and have some fun. I'm, I'm living a dream. It's awesome. You called Lions star Calvin Johnson maybe one of the biggest freaks in the NFL. What have you envisioned since you signed this deal about what it would be like to throw to that guy? Oh, it's going to be awesome. He, he is uh, unbelievable. I, I got a chance to uh, play against him in college and see what he can do. And he's, he's a great player, and I'm excited to get out to Detroit and see what's going on. I know you've received maybe a few text messages, right, since you signed this deal, but I know just a few moments ago you got a special one from the Manning brothers. What did they say to you? They just said congrats, you earned it, and, uh, you know, have fun with it. you got to enjoy this process, and that means a lot to me to get texts from those guys. They've been... Uh, such great players in this league for a while now, so it's it's a fun time. Matthew, thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Chris, over to you. Oh. All right, Aaron. Okay. Thank you very much, Matthew. Can you've been in this position. Is there extra pressure being the number one pick overall on you? Going yeah, I, I came into New York, so imagine the pressure being in New York, but you, you imagine going to Detroit. Detroit, they haven't had a winning team in I don't know how many years. And a young quarterback, young quarterbacks in this league, they need players around them. You think about Peyton Manning, he had a little pieces around him. He was able to be successful. Hey, you hey, have to have I appreciate players around. you hand on that pressure as a number one receiver, but it's a lot different being the number one quarterback. There's no question. The bottom of the, look, there are metaphorical dead bodies all over the place. The quarterbacks have been drafted number one in this spot that don't have the resolve to live through what they're going to live through. Matthew Stafford's going to face some incredible pressure. If he doesn't have the resolve, and I mean steal a resolve, of Peyton Manning or Troy Aikman, he will be another one that will fall by the wayside. And that's not about arm strength. That's not about footwork. That's about a DNA attitude. But I also, but I also don't think it's about him. I, I don't. Well, we'll see. They do have Donna Culpepper to start the year, and we'll see how long that goes. And Stafford watches and, and waits. And will he be Peyton Manning of 98? Will he be Tim Couch of 99? I mean, there, there, there's, there's a spectrum there. And now... Okay. With the first pick in the 2009 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Matthew Stafford. <laughs> Welcome to the NFL, Matthew Stafford. Hugging his parents and the rest of his family. The man who will be making more guaranteed money than anyone in the history of the NFL, more than anybody currently playing in the NFL, is about to step to the stage and take his first steps as an NFL player right towards the commissioner wearing the Honolulu blue hat. He is a Detroit Lion. fans who are here in Radio City Music Hall. Mike Mayock, 
Matthew Stafford is the number one overall pick. Ninth time out of the last 12 number one overall picks to be a quarterback. Six two and a quarter, 225 pounds, a better athlete than people want to give him credit for. I've been very demonstrative about the fact that I thought Detroit should go in a different direction. However, he has elite arm strength. I believe some inconsistent pocket awareness that he can work with once he gets into the NFL. But the thing is, he can make every throw. He's got a huge arm. He's very athletic. He is a tough kid. And I truly believe he's got all the tools to be a great quarterback. So despite the fact that I thought they should have taken the safer pick, this kid has a chance to be a heck of a football player. Yeah, for 50 years, this organization has been looking for the next Bobby Lane. And how fitting is it for, for Matthew Stafford to come from Bobby Lane's high school, Highland Park in Dallas? He's, they've got to surround this guy. He's got all the talent in the world. We know that. But now they've got to improve the rest of that football team to give that quarterback a chance. What a great step for the Detroit Lions. they got a long way to go. This is the first step. They got a big arm quarterback, and I tell you this, they got a great receiver, and that's a great combination. Who would have thought Georgia and Georgia Tech yeah, would work true. together in rebuilding the Detroit Lions? This is I, a great pick. I have to be honest, every time I see the first pick since I've been coming here to draft, I get the chills because I remember being called up on that stage. It's like I have flashbacks, but you think about Matthew Stafford, there's one guy that's very happy. There's one guy, his receiver, Charles Johnson, is sitting at home like, oh, my God, somebody to throw the ball to me, downfield, get the ball to me. If the two of them can become, say, half of what Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison was to the Indianapolis coach, the Detroit Lions have done well. Well, I like the pick. I, it's, it's, whether, it's whether the people will be in there. We're talking about the booth. It's whether the people will show up in Detroit to boo him, if that's the case. Well, it's New York here. I mean, you <laughs> got to get the Bronx cheer. That's the way to get baptized in the NFL. They also have Kevin Smith at running back. Yes. who had a very successful first season in the NFL. Uh, and the question is, can they keep him upright? And there's many other problems on defense. They do have the 20th overall pick in this first round as well to try and address something. And also the first pick, obviously, the second. They have five of the first 84 picks. So an opportunity to become a better football team. One caveat. I'm not sure you throw him into the middle of the fray week one or not. And, Rich, I know you feel strongly from a fan's point of view. From a football point of view, their running attack is number 30 in the NFL. Flacco and Matt Ryan had the benefit of a great running attack. 52 sacks last year their quarterbacks endured. If you throw this kid in for every one Peyton Manning in the NFL that's able to sustain that kind of beating, there are five Joey Harringtons. Think about that, Detroit think about and there's his uh, other team team Stafford right there uh, on the stage here at Radio City Music Hall uh, that is a Stafford uh, right between his parents his mom he said to me last night lives in a duplex the first thing he's going to do with his new money is buy her a new house and Deion Sanders would know all about that. He is with Matthew Stafford right now. He's ready for prime time, presented by KFC. Rich Eisen just said that the first thing you're going to do with your new money is buy your mother a new house. Is that accurate? Uh, probably. You know, uh, I'd love to get her up in a nice place. And somewhere when I come home, I can visit and stay with her, too. There's a tremendous amount of pressure placed on you being the first overall pick. Have you spoken to Matt Ryan or Joe Flack on how to handle this whole situation of going into your rookie season as a now NFL quarterback? I haven't spoken to him but you can just watch them on the field and understand what it takes. Those guys are great workers on and off the field and, and uh, obviously earn the respect of their teammates, which is something I'm going to work hard to do. And, uh, you know, th those guys definitely set the bar high for us rookies. I asked you this question the other day, and I want to reiterate it for the people who did not know it. What's the first thing you're going to say to your new teammates in Detroit? You know, that I, that I'm going to put my nose to the ground and work, man. That's, that's all you can do. And, uh, you know, winning cures everything, and that's, that's something we got to try to do uh, when we're up there in Detroit and, and have some fun doing it. You have a pretty good receiver named Mr. Johnson, but no running game in that offense. How do you look forward to seeing dealing with that? Uh, it's it's going to be a challenge. You know, football is a, a game of 11 guys on offense versus 11 on defense, and it takes everybody. and And we'll find a way to get it done, I'm sure. And uh, Calvin's a heck of a player. He's uh, he's going to be fun to throw to. I wish you the best. Thank you very much. Back to you, Rich. All right, Dion. Thanks very much. So Matthew Stafford is the number one overall pick in this draft. Mark Sanchez, meanwhile. Is Three players. Schwartz said the Lions didn't go into the draft with a plan to take a quarterback number one, but everything they saw on Stafford, including his film from high school, set him apart as a special player. Each step along the way, he jumped through whatever hoop we put up in front of him. And uh, like I said, at, at, at that point, it became, it became clear that he was going to be our guy.
I'm just going to go out there and work hard. That's the number one thing I can do and and uh, be as involved here at this at this place and, and with this football team as I possibly can be and uh, let my play do the talking. It may have been a surprise to most to see the Lions go tight end and safety with their next two picks, but for Schwartz, it was a no-brainer. His skill set is NFL ready right now. And like I said, we talked about being big and physical and running the football, and that makes our front seven stronger right away. I think I'm a complete tight end, and with a complete tight end coming in, being able to do both, you know, that's, that just that just adds more, more in the in the pass game and, and the run game as well. And a physical safety like Western Michigan's Dalmas will make an impact on defense as well. You don't have to watch very long on film to to see what kind of player he is, um, a multi-dimensional player. A guy that has some corner in his background. He's uh, he got great range against the pass. He's got great instincts. When asked whether or not he felt like the Lions got the best players at each position, quarterback, tight end, and safety, Schwartz cautioned that none of these guys have played a single down of football in the NFL yet. We felt strong about each one. Um, you know, whether they're the best or not, you know, their, their play is going to speak to that. In Allen Park, Jennifer Hammond, Fox 2 Sports. All right, so let's take a look at what the Lions have done. Today in the third round, they added DeAndre Levy, a linebacker out of Wisconsin. Derek Williams, the wide out and kick returner from Penn State. We already showed you the top three. In the fourth round, they picked up Sandy Lee Hill, a huge defensive tackle with raw skills out of Stillman. They selected Aaron Brown, a running back out of TCU, who has also shown skills as a kick returner. In the seventh round, they selected offensive tackle Lydon Murtha out of Nebraska and Zach Follett, a linebacker from Cal. And with their final pick, they took tight end Dan Gronkowski out of Maryland. All right, now this draft has its critics. The team, in some minds, did not answer the defensive needs in the first round when they drafted a pair of offensive players. I asked general manager Martin Mayhew about that earlier tonight when we sat down and looked at the last two days. Well, we talked about that quite a while back, about not really focusing on need, but focusing on value. And it's important for us to take the best players. And we came out of this thing, I think, with the best quarterback, the best safety, the best tight end. Uh, those were guys on our board that were ranked really high, and we took those players. And that's the right thing for us to do at this point, I think. All right, let me talk about that quarterback. You, you make this kind of commitment to a kid. You have a game plan. What can you share with us about that? I would say this. I think the reason why so many quarterbacks fail is they get rushed on the field. And a lot of them get drafted by teams that aren't really good teams. Um, so from my standpoint, we'll get this guy out there whenever he's ready, whenever he can function, whenever our offense is functioning. Uh, then, then we'll get Matthew out there. Brandon Pettigrew is a guy who looks like he can be a sixth offensive lineman or he can be a big asset in the passing game. Correct, correct. The guy's a really good blocker. He's an NFL caliber blocker right now. Really good receiver. He doesn't really stretch the scene, but he's really good in the short passing game and a big target for your quarterback. So he's really going to help us. You look at Lewis Delmas. You talk about the safety position. You talk about guys like Reed and Sanders and Palomalo. This has become an impact position in the NFL, especially for guys that can play the pass and come up and stuff the run. Does he have that kind of potential? He does. He has great athletic ability. He plays some corner in the pass. He can cover man to man. Uh, he's a really good athlete and he's a heat-seeking missile on the field. Let me, player. let me throw some other guys at you. DeAndre Levy. First of all, do you project him as a guy who might play in the middle? He can play all three spots. Uh, he'll, he'll get an opportunity to play Mike Forrest, but he can play any spot, I think. Throw uh, Derek Williams in there. This, this, this kid who did some exciting things in school, and also you've talked before about uh, having some low-hanging fruit when it came to the return game. Right. He's a guy that comes in and improves that really from day one. Right. We, had a, we had a special emphasis on improving our, 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 our return game, and we had a board next to our board with all the returners. And that way, as the draft went on, we looked at the, at the returners that were available to us. And this guy fell to us. We think he's going to be a really great player. Slot guy as well, maybe? Slot guy. Great chance for that. Uh, this guy was the number one rated recruit coming out, out of high school. So he's had a lot of athletic ability, a lot of, a lot of potential with him. Sammy Lee Hill. Yeah. <laughs> 6 4, 329 out of Stillman. Yeah. Bit of a project, but clearly athleticism is a key. You saw that. Great size, great athleticism. Uh, the guy's a little bit raw. He'll take some time, but this guy's going to be a good player, too. Aaron Brown, uh, another guy maybe that fits into the return game? We talked about Aaron in the third or fourth round, and he, and he slipped back. Um, this guy's a really good kickoff return guy, very fast, was injured as a junior and didn't play as much as a senior. This guy has a lot of potential. Is he a potential third down back as well, or do you see him just as a special teamer? He could be a third down back. He could be a, 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 a wide receiver for us. He could be a return man. He can do a lot of different things. How about Lydon Murth, offensive lineman out of Nebraska, another guy who, who's battled injuries a little bit? Yeah, Lydon kind of caught my attention at the, at the combine. The guy's a really great athlete, great size, 6'7". 
Um, he's, he's got some development potential. He's also, you know, he's kind of raw, but he's got a good chance to be, be a really good player for us. Zach Follett, I read one scouting report on him that said if you polled the quarterbacks in the Pac-10, asked him who the hardest hitter in the conference was, they would say hands down it's him. Yeah, very physical guy. He's played inside, he played outside. You know, he can do it all, and I think he'd be a really good special teams player for us now with a chance to develop into a starter. And, and Jim kind of talked about him as a guy that can really play all three positions across there. Mm -hmm. Very smart guy. A really smart guy and a real physical player. And finally, you wrapped it up with Dan Gronkowski. Uh, you probably didn't go in thinking you were going to draft two tight ends. Is this just what the board brought to you? It, it is. I mean, we really liked him early. Uh, some of our area scouts really loved him. He did. You know, he's just a big physical presence as a blocker and a really good, good, good receiver, too. So we like him. All in all, your first draft. Give, give me your feelings now as you wrap up this weekend. You know what? It was, it was great to get through it. It was great. The, the board kind of spoke to us, you know. I mean, I, I, thought, I, I think it went really well. But like I said before, you don't grade it now. We grade it later, and we'll see how we, how we did. All right, let's to the, go to the round table. A couple of radio free agents joining us tonight. Bob Wanowski, who has found work with the Detroit News. Just kidding. Yes, He's been hey. there for a while. Oh, 100 years. Glad to see you're employed. All right, Sean Belizean with the Plymouth Whalers, and I'm live as well. Guys, let's get right to it. It seems like this is a draft that's going to come down to whether or not you believe in just going for value or whether or not you believe that this team should have been filling holes. Uh, the critics say they missed filling some holes. Those that believe in this draft will say, you know what, they were taking the best player available in a couple of years to see if it works Let's out. Let's not kid ourselves. It's going to come down to whether or not Matthew Stafford's a good NFL quarterback, too. That will be the, the overriding thing. But I, I must say, Dan, I, I'm underwhelmed and I'm concerned. And I'm concerned from this standpoint. I understand going in with a plan. We're going to take value. We're going to take value. We're going to take value but at some point you do realize you have to field a defense this coming season in the NFL they do require you you don't get to jump four years ahead in your progress you do have to field a team and I think they got so caught taking two tight ends including one in the first round that really kind of freaked me out a little bit and I'm one who believes in this guy these guys plan underwhelmed is a, is a word disappointed would be another word how often do you get three picks in the top 33 in the National Football League and I'm sorry I look at those three picks and I say to myself, okay, Matt Stafford, there's no guarantees. Anybody that thinks that Matt Stafford is a guarantee is crazy. I think even the Lions brass would say that. At, at 18, I'm sorry I don't get the tight end. At, or, or at 20. And, and maybe because I was kind of high on Mike Ower and I thought he could come in, especially a tight end not known for his speed. And he better darn well have speed when you're talking about this offensive line. And, and I'm sorry, when I look at Delmas, I can't help but think of the same things that we've heard in the previous few years. Jared Alexander, and, and I mean, this is it's the Daniel same Bullock. thing. Daniel Bullock and Gerald Alexander. I hope yeah, that, but I the hope di he's different. Di difference being that most teams in the league, it seemed, had Delmas as their number one safety. They did. I, You're don't right. they, I don't think, sure. looking back, that Bullocks or Alexander were regarded as, as the top team safety. And, and, and here's what I keep coming back to. And, and this is a day when everybody's an expert. But they're sitting there at 20, and everybody, myself included, and Brandy on the radio, were thinking, all right, this is where they take Maliuga, Maliuga. Maliuga doesn't go there. Yeah. And we're all like, they didn't take him. But you know what? Then he lasts all the way until 37, and you say, you know what? There must be something these NFL well, teams know that we in the media don't know when we go out there playing the role of Mel No, you're Kiefer. right about that. You're right. And that's why people shouldn't freak out. And that's out. one example of many. Right, but th this is what concerns me. When you just follow your board and you tell everybody all we did was follow our board, where is the accountability? Where is the cleverness? Where is the strategy? The accountability strategy? is in setting up the board. If these guys can't play, then this is a, this is a mark against no. Mayhew and, and But at and some Schwartz point, you have and, to go to else. need. You have to, I, I, I go by this example. If Josh Freeman was their highest rated guy on the board, the quarterback at number 20, would they take him, another quarterback? No. No, no. no I, don't, so, I don't think, I, I so think obviously some there's, some sense, go, right. there's some sense applied to it. What, what, so you need defensive players. What's a greater need at that point in time? Getting another Pearson, Bullocks, or Jared Alexander, or getting a guy like a, like a, a Ray who was available, or a James Laurinaitis? I have a problem looking at this team, and I'm going to go back to something that you said. What are the Detroit Lions today? What are they? What is their mission statement? I, let, let me play devil's advocate for one second because everybody, and, and I agree, that defense, trust me, I saw Oof. that defense not Oof. good last year. was ranked 32nd. The offense was ranked 30th. Sure. It's not Absolutely. like they were taking a unit that was ranked 10th in the league and started to improve that. 
The point is, they need help everywhere. everywhere. Totally agree with that. But what is a greater need at this point in time? Do you want to grab the fourth of safety when you already have three? Granted, I know the kid's supposed to be something else, but I, I think a lot of times what you have to remember is fans heard that about Gerald Alexander and heard that about Daniel Bell Bullocks. And I understand you're not going to please everybody, but I don't care what anybody says. At that moment, at that moment, James Laurinaitis is going to help this team more. Ray Malahula is going to help this team more. I, I firmly believe but, that. But at the same time, 32 teams passed on Laurinaitis. Sure. They were drafting other linebackers before they drafted him. Well, but 32 and, and teams other, passed on the safety, too, that they took. First safety off the board, though, there's something to be said if you're looking for value and you're looking you for a guy. Day, and and remember, the, out of those safeties they have, Alexander's got a neck. No, you're right. And Bullock's mm -hmm, is coming mm -hmm, off a knee. Mm -hmm. I agree. The, I, don't have, I don't have a problem with Delmas. I really don't. You've got the he, problem he, with Pettigrew. And Pettigrew which which and I Stafford. disagree. I I'm think it's a, a huge Stafford weapon guy, if you use them Although right. I'm willing to give him a chance. But this, if their marching order, if their mission statement is bigger, tougher, physicaler, I don't see how that happens. Let me ask you this. Isn't the bottom line, and they're yelling at me, we got to go. Isn't the bottom line Ooh. where this team is in two years? Well, or three years or four, but, or, you, or two, but they or don't get three. a free pass until then. That's the thing. They don't. I, I don't know that the bottom line is next year coming off 0-16 with the worst oh, record no. in the it NFL. It shouldn't be. With the worst shouldn't roster be. in the NFL. But they don't NFL. get a free pass. Be. Don't give them one. I'm don't not, give them I, one. Because Stafford, free Delmas, Pettigrew, those guys are what they're going to be held accountable for. Is that a home run, though? Out of three, those those three out of the top 33, is that He's a home run to you? That. I'm sorry, it's my fault. I think when yell you walk me. out of there with the with the top quarterback on the board, the top safety on the board, and the top tight end on the board, there's something to be said. Granted, the defense needs a lot of help. I am not I, arguing yeah, that the defense at needs all. Help. They're yelling at me. Stop yeah, talking. Do you want to read that? And season ended on December 28th in Green Bay. All fans could talk about was the upcoming draft, the chance to pick up help, the opportunity to bring in fresh new faces, and the right to draft the best player in college football. With the first pick in the 2009 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Matthew Stafford, quarterback, Georgia. With the words of the commissioner, it became official. Stafford is coming to Detroit on a six-year, $78 million contract. 41.7 of it will be guaranteed. Local 4 exclusively captured video of Stafford and his parents pulling up to the practice facility this morning in a limo. Stafford was introduced to the media and said he is ready to play for last year's 0-16 team. I'm a competitive guy. I've said it all along, and uh, it's something that, that excites me. You know, I think it does scare some people, and it, it might... Uh, you know, have deterred some people from wanting to come here, but all along it's something that I've, uh, I've wanted to do. And I'm just going to go out there and, and work hard. That's the number one thing I can do and, and uh, be as involved here at this, at this place and, and with this football team as I possibly can be and uh, let my play do the talking. Head coach Jim Schwartz has high expectations for the 6'5", 263-pound tight end from Oklahoma State, Brandon Pettigrew. He expects me to come in and, and you know, compete and play that big role and I'm definitely I'm definitely down to do it. Like I said, I think I'm a complete tight end and with a complete tight end coming in, you know, that's that just that just adds more. More in the in the pass game and, and the run game as well. Western Michigan safety Lewis Delmas wants to make a difference even though he's a rookie. I always feel on the chip of my shoulder. I mean I always feel like, you know, I'm I'm the underdog. I'm underdog no matter what no matter who I'm playing, no matter where I'm playing. I, I always felt like I was the underdog, so I still got a lot of food. All three players are eager to learn the ropes and compete for a starting job. I gotta earn everything and uh, that's the way uh, that's the way I see it and I know that's the way everybody else sees it. Well it's just gonna come down to me going out playing, you know, showing them that, that I'm a, a great player. You know, I'm at least I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and play hard as I as I can. I plan on coming here, you know, and this and just uh, proving everybody wrong because, you know, everybody think, you know, I'm too small to be a leader. I'm too small to hit, you know, but I'm coming in here, you know, trying to be a major impact. We have a, a specific role in mind with, e with each of these players. Like I said yesterday, each of these players had tremendous consensus in the draft room, which was important um, for everybody. We felt strong about each one. Whether they're the best or not, you know, their, their play is going to speak to that. Certainly will, Coach. Here's a look at who else the Lions picked up over the weekend. In the third round, Detroit drafted outside linebacker from Wisconsin, DeAndre Levy, and Penn State wide receiver Derek Williams. They have help on the defensive side of the ball. In the fourth round was 6'4", 329-pound defensive tackle from Stillman, Sammy Lee Hill. Then in the sixth round, Detroit drafted TCU running back Aaron Brown. They picked up three players in the seventh round. Offensive tackle from Nebraska, Lydon Murtha, California outside linebacker Zach Pollitt, and Maryland tight end Dan Gronkowski.
I got my big fella back. <laughs> Lomas Brown is here. You have watched the draft this weekend. Yes. Matthew Stafford guaranteed almost $42 million. Is he getting too much money, Lomas? Well, you know, I wouldn't say that he's getting too much money. Really, that's the going rate. If you look at what the quarterbacks have been getting, those are your marquee guys. And to me, if the Lions think this is the guy, this is your franchise guy, finally, we got this guy to <laughs> deliver us then you pay him the money. But if he isn't, boy, that's going to be a big costly mistake. He is replacing Bobby Lane. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah <that's>... exactly. <laughs> okay, now, do you think he can start right away? No, I, I, it's okay. going to be hard. It really is going to be hard for him to start right, right away. He would have to be a great, great learner. And still, with experience, you need to get some experience under your belt before a guy is thrown out there, especially at the quarterback position. The other thing about putting a young quarterback back there, it puts your offense at a disadvantage because because again, the defense is just going to blitz this young guy. They know he's young. They know he don't know how to make certain reads. So they'll see it more pressure than they ever seen. So for the sake of your offensive line and the rest of you guys on offense, you shouldn't start a young guy like right away. Okay, so let's talk about the 20th overall pick because a lot of people are talking yeah. about it. They're upset that the Lions took a tight end and not uh, the gentleman out of USC, Ray Maluga. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? Why didn't they go with defense well, with that pick? I mean, that's a great – from what I'm hearing, they looked at the talent. And obviously this kid, uh, Brandon Pettigrew, great talent, physical specimen, mm -hmm. can do a lot of things. My only question about this is if the Lions are going to use this guy. In the past, they haven't used tight ends. We've never been the team, if you look back mm -hmm. all the way back to the Charlie Sanders era, we haven't been the big team at using our tight ends. So are you going to bring this guy in to be able to help, uh, to help Jeff Backers or help your tackle block? To me, at 20, no. If you're going to use this mm -hmm. guy, then it's going to be a great pick for you because the tight end can do a lot of other things for your offense. Just as a casual observer, it does not look to me that either line got better. Yeah. Not a, much. Yeah, I know, and that's, not that's a concern. And we all know, well, at least I know, the foundation <laughs> is built with the, the guys up front. That's your offense and defensive line. I really would have thought we would have addressed that. The one thought I might have on this is, is maybe Jeff Backus really didn't want to move to the inside. Should you know? he move, though? Well, I think Jeff is, to me, Jeff is a better guard. He's physically built for the guard position. You know, he's at a disadvantage because of his arm length. Mm -hmm. That hurts you at tackle. To me, get you a tackle, move Jeff inside. I think he could be a very, very good inside player, possibly a Pro Bowl player. That'll solidify okay. your inside, and then you got your tackles. Give me some grades. Well, you know, I'm going to give him a C. I, okay. I really am, you know, with the, these picks. Because we don't know. It's still the unknown out there. You got a quarterback that you pick. Could be your franchise quarterback. You just don't know. You got a tight end. Are we going to use this tight end? We just don't know. So because I got all these I just don't know right now, I have to give them a C. Have you been going to see your ex-teammate, Robert you know Porsche? What? I might be going over there. Yeah, I might <laughs> go over there and drop in on them right now. And if I'm over there, some of you come over there and join me. We can sit around and talk about the draft. Oh, please. Talk about the, the quarterback making this money. Maybe the Maybe the quarterback will be over there. Maybe he could treat us. Come on up. All right, Come 41 on over. million. 41 Man. million. Tonight, after the draft was finally put to bed, I went back out to Allen Park to catch up with Lions team president Tom Lewan to get his thoughts on the eventful weekend. What I'm really happy about is the process that we went through. I think uh, the process that Martin and Jim developed uh, involving all the coaching staff, all the scouting staff, getting agreement on the picks, staying, and most importantly, staying true to the board. It's about picking the best players. We had a, a lot of needs that we need to fill. Uh, there are others that, that are still there that will continue to look in uh, the veteran free agent pool. We'll look at guys who get cut over the next uh, few months uh, and continue to build this team. But we did it the right way. We said that from day one, and, and, and I'm proud of the way we uh, handled it today. People look at the draft and say you only got four guys on defense. What do you say to the fans that, that say, you know, they needed more than just four guys on defense? Well, we, we, what I say is we stayed true to the board. Okay. We drafted the players that, that were the best players on the board. We got the best uh, quarterback in the, in the draft. We got the, the, the highest rated quarterback. We got the highest rated uh, tight end. We got the highest rated safety on the board. I think when you, you, you look for quality, not quantity. Okay, so you did draft for need or for talent and not need. Is that correct? Well, Is that I, a fair statement? I, I think it's. I, I think talent comes first. Okay. And and I think where you where you get into trouble is if you just take need.
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that's why I said I really like the process that we had. We stayed true to the board. And we found some good football players who are going to come in and help this team get better. Of the 10 guys that you drafted this weekend, how many of those play immediately next year? Well, we'll find out. They've got to come in this weekend, and they've got a rookie mini camp. And as Jim said, when they're ready to play and when they're the best players, they'll play. And we're looking forward to, to, to starting the competition this weekend and then carrying it into training camp in uh, July. Rob Parker from ClickOnDetroit.com is with us. Congratulations. Thank you very Love much. It. Very happy to be here. Before we talk about the NFL draft, we need to take a moment of silence for the passing of B. Arthur over the weekend. If, for those of you that don't know, Rob Parker is a huge Golden <laughs> Girls fan. So let's just observe a moment of silence okay. for B. Arthur. She was a tremendous, tremendous actress. woman yes, actress. Absolutely. So she, she will, will be, missed. be missed. No doubt she about it. She will be missed. Okay, your thoughts on the NFL draft. They have six offensive players, four defensive players. You heard Tom Lewan say not all of their needs have been met. Your thoughts? You know, I, I guess when you look at the draft, you could always say, well, we took the best players available and things like that. But it's just curious when you have a defense that was the worst in the NFL two years running and you get these top three picks in the top 33 and, uh, you know, you have one defensive player, a safety, in that mix so I just think it's the the pick of a tight end there is the question mark where people will wonder I understand the quarterback and I understand all that the other thing is when people talk about the best available I remember a few years ago in the draft after they drafted Charles Rogers and after they drafted Roy Williams they drafted Mike Williams and said he was the best player available we don't draft for needs we just take the best athletes and how did that work out so the Lions you know what the draft was okay I don't think it was great I think Brandon Pettigrew is going to play next year. He's a big guy. He can do a lot of things for this football team. And as Jim Brandstetter told me today, he is a guy that's going to protect your $78 million investment. That's in that nice. But I would have liked to have also seen uh, some big guys on the offensive and defensive lines. I mean, where was that? That's what I would like to see. And if they have to go out and get people, fine. But the Lions, that's where it all starts. I can't believe what's happened here over the last eight years or so, where if you don't build up the, in the trenches, you won't win football games. Anybody will tell you that. Do you think they will do it over the next few weeks? I mean, Tom Lewan said he's going to stay on the phone. He's still working to try and get some more I'm help. I'm sure they will. I mean, they'll have to do something, but it's just, it's just curious. I don't know the Lions. The, the sports bars, that 24-second sports bar in Berkeley with a whole group of people, and people were not happy, especially at no. the second pick. You know that. People were disappointed. People were upset. Absolutely. People were upset. Fans were definitely.